Naga, thank you very much. I think we will start now. Uh, we have our guest speaker here. Um, Mr. Wansing and Mr. Wansing. If you've heard of him or you've seen him somewhere or have worked with him. All right, thank you very much. Okay, our speaker today is Mr. Wansing, who owns Garden City. Kalana Garden City Rewaya. Investments, eh? um, Polo company, yeah? right? uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a company But we're interested in, um, in, in, in how Mr. Wansing you know, came to be a, a very successful businessman. Eh? Okay, Mr. Wansing, uh, we'd like to... Uh, the University of South Pacific would like to welcome you uh, this afternoon uh, uh, in your presentation, and we hope that uh, the people that are looking at you today and listening to your presentation is going to be inspiring for them to uh, uh, to actually go out and start their own business. And I know there are a lot of farmers that are sitting amongst uh, amongst the crowd here today, um, eager and anticipating that uh, that what you'll give to them that they will replicate and take back to the villages or to the places where they have come from. Can we just give a round of applause to Mr. Wasing, please? <laughs> it's Mr. Yi Wasing. All right. Hi, Mr. Wasing. Put it down a bit. All right. Yeah. Mbola binaka. Kwa kwa bosti kwa biti, bwa mix, eh? Yeah, we never have a semi, we never have a ready. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you, Semi, for your invitation to speak here. Yeah, I, wa I wasn't sure who I was going to speak to. I'm very surprised that so many of you and so many um, grown ups. <laughs> I thought I was coming to speak to uh, no second or third year students. Uh, I was a student in, uh, at the university uh, way back in 1979. At that time, the, um, you know, we did our science in the um, sets done, you know, where the uh, New, um, New Zealand Air Force used to have their hangars. So it's been over 42 years since I was a student here. Um, well, I was born in Lautoka, my father actually uh, had a garden uh, um, on, 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 on contract farming, growing vegetables to the uh, CSR. The, the land was allocated to him and the water. And then uh, his job was to grow all the vegetables to the, uh, all those Australian, um, uh, what, what do they call them now, the uh, supervisors or the managers. And then whatever surplus he had, they had to sell on the side. Later on, my father moved on to uh, uh, Lomaivuna. Lomaivuna, 1963, our family moved there. So I started school in uh, Lomaivuna Settlement School, 1964. And I believe uh, Master Semi used to teach up in uh, Deloe Male village there, so he knows that area well. Anyway, if you, I'm, I'm just telling you to, uh, this to know where I came from and how I progressed. Eh? And Lomaibuna at that time was so remote. I remember when uh, the, the kids, when we were young, like six, seven, or eight years old, our world was just confined to Lomaibuna, maybe Wunindawa, eh? and then we rarely came to Suba. The bus came maybe two, two times a day, morning, afternoon. And then when you had an argument, oh, by the way, and all the, all the other things that we wanted to do at that time was to become a bus driver. That was our dream job. <laughs> and uh, I remember Shu, he was the bus driver. And we regarded him as our hero. He knew everything about the outside world. Eh? So if you had an argument, <laughs> So that was our little world. And then I grew up, uh, set in intermediate uh, 
uh, exam in Lomabuna, then we had a choice to which uh, school I should go to. You know, the, at that time, you know, in the rural area, you have to go to um, class seven and eight. You have to go out of the rural area to go to RKS, QBS, Lelin. And I remember my father at that time, uh, you know, he was very illiterate. He didn't know, you know, where to send me to. Eh? So, so I remember he asked. Seek advice from the pay clerk of the agricultural station. Now I start to know that the pay clerk is a re really a very, the, probably the lowest rank in the civil service. <laughs> but at that time in Lomebuna, in Fijian, you can't have a lot of money. 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 Sangai suri tio ko me lako me vale mukundo na natoa okla mo bago ni vale na so na whisky ota whisky kay tori ko sa me malibu libu yo sangai to ito roko mo libu li lelin ni kuribu li lotu kuribu li bagay alo kake dia o sangai ato lelin sangai kla na kana borak so today I'm not sure whether to curse or to thank that bunny wall eh. And, uh, and I think today, nowadays, probably no one would probably seek advice from the pay clerk. <laughs> so, so, so I just tell you that that was my world uh, growing up. And then, but uh, later I came to university, then I, uh, you know, to agricultural college, and I was the one of the well, I think I was the first student to actually graduate uh, from agricultural college with distinction, and then I went back. Uh, directly to the farm. My father had about 10 acres growing bananas there. And my father uh, and mother had died by then, eh? so I was alone. So I took over my father's farm. And then I leased another 40 acres down in, uh, uh, just about two kilometers away. As you know, uh, despite all the talks, you know, about uh, encouraging young people to go farming and being an entrepreneur, like what the government is doing now to you, an entrepreneur. The reality is hits when you go out there and you start to ask for loans. And when you are new, eh, no one will look at you. That, that's the reality. Eh? When I was like early 20s, the bank manager looked at me and, you know, he's probably right. Eh? He said, if I give you this money, you're probably not going to pay it back. you probably work for one year, spend all the money and run away to Australia or somewhere. So that's the perception of the banks. Later on, when you prove your worth and you have some more assets, the banks will actually come to you. They, they will come to you. Not one bank, but several banks will compete for your business. So the starting um, point is very very difficult. Oh, I see Humphrey there. Humphrey, you should be talking, not me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so anyway, I, I, I started, uh, after college, I started in um, Loma Ibuna, uh, growing what my father used to grow, ginger and dalo. I grew pineapples. I expanded a bit. Uh, but I was hoping to get a loan from the bank. Eh? So when I put in my application, of course, my loan, uh, to be expected, was rejected. Um, I, I, I know some of you probably heard of this already. And then somehow my file was maneuvered to the managing director's desk, who was the Mr. Lesenian Garcia at that time. But then I remember very distinctly one of the officers coming up to Lomabuna to tell me, Mr. Garcia would like to see you. On Thursday next week, you know, the file is at his desk, and then he might give you a reconsideration. You know, I said, okay. So I was very nervous. So all through the next few days, I studied my proposal. Eh? So I thought, because Garcia had a farm in uh, Waimbao. He was a farmer. And I knew I could not fool him if I, um, um, you know, if I make up things. So I look at my yield of the ginger, cash flow, uh, some other technical stuff, and then I prepared. So I went up to his office, and then I think uh, it was on a Thursday, and I remember him sitting on that desk there. I was very nervous. I was only early, early 20s. He looked at me and he said, 
I got your file here. And I was anticipating the question that you will ask. And he asked only one question. He said, is the amount of money you are asking enough? That was the only question he asked. And then I said, I think that is enough, sir. And then he signed the, the loan approval payment right on the spot. So that, that was my uh, break at that time, which uh, gave me the, um, uh, to be able to expand the farm a little bit more. But just after that, just after a few years after that, maybe two or three years, while my loan was, uh, 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 the prepayment was just starting, at that time, remember, the interest was 13.5%. It was quite high, eh? And then Cyclone Kina hit us in, um, I think, end of 1991. And then I, I think I lost about 80, 70, 80% of my uh, crop at that time. So that, that was a hard uh, time uh, rebuilding. Um, so, so a lot of people ask me, uh, uh, young people come and ask me today about going farming. And I tell them that it's going to be very hard. There are a lot of risk. A lot of uncertainties in the, uh, in the market, in uh, 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 production problems, and so on. And I was very lucky that I managed to uh, succeed. You know? Then I went on to, um, because I was growing ginger, then I went on to establish a ginger factory, processing uh, ginger, crystallized ginger, exporting to... Uh, um, uh, to Europe, America, New Zealand, and Australia. I'll tell you a story how I did that. Um, I also uh, started exporting, uh, exporting um, uh, taro and uh, uh, frozen goods to New Zealand and Australia and America, and, uh, and also Angola. Angola in 1998. But uh, the fact is, starting is very hard. You know, starting is very hard. So, uh, uh, so while I'm talking now, I'd just like to share four, four, like four uh, core factors or core, four core values which I think made me success or, may, uh, or helped me to be lucky, to be successful. And, and these are four fundamental ones. Because all the things about writing business plans and all that, these are all technical things which you learn, uh, you know, from, um, you know, from, uh, from your friends or from uh, uh, books and so on. But to me, there are four essential core values that are very essential uh, in, in, a, in a business success. Uh, and, uh, and, and today, if you look at today, the, the whole world is in the, you know, an, an economic uh, downturn. Market is down, vistas are down. But, but I believe the world is going, you know, the, uh, uh, the world is, the, the, the population in the world is still growing. Eh? And, I, and if you look at the world to, uh, today, every day there's 123,000 more people in the world. There's 200,000 people born and about 70,000 people uh, passing, passing away. So there's a net increase of 123,000 people. So all that 123,000 people every day, all those people will need to be fed, uh, will need uh, education, will need housing, will need TVs, will need all the services that, uh, 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 you know, that, um, that uh, they, will, uh, they, will, uh, they will need when they grow up. Um, so, 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 so the, uh, so the, and, and, and with the rise and the development of new technology and the, and, 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 the, and, and the coming together, the interconnecting world, I believe the, I believe the, uh, you know, the, 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 the life, uh, you know, life in the world will get uh, more advanced and better. Just to keep things in perspective, you know? Because some people will think that because of this pandemic and all that, uh, there's no, no, no use to do anything anymore, you know? And that is true, sometimes. Um, that uh, you get really, uh, you know, so much negativity. But the world is still continuing to grow, uh, technology is still advancing. 
So let me share with you those four core values. I think the first and very important thing is the family support. Family support is very important. Especially if you're out in the rural area and you're farming. So at my, so at my, my uh, uh, a lot of young people come to me for advice. Eh? Uh, no, um, and, and I tell them, are you single or married? And um, well, most of them are, are still single. And I tell them, my first advice to you is to, whether you're a girl or a boy, when I talk to a girl or a boy, is that uh, the, probably the most important decision is, uh, you know, select a good mate. <laughs> because without that family support, your business will uh, struggle. And even when, it, uh, when you progress and find success, it is not as sweet, you know, as when you can share it with your loved ones. And the, then the prime motivation of a lot of business, uh, entrepreneurs, small business, family business, why we work so hard is that our next generation gets a better life. So that family support is very important. And of course, in a family business, like me and my wife, when you two together, there's always a lot of disagreements. You know? You know? A lot of disagreements. And sometimes that is good. But sometimes the man, especially the man, needs to step back. You know, and uh, uh, because I find that the woman's, uh, a man dreams a lot, eh? living on a plane. I, I, I know, uh, 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 you know, we men, we have plenty of plans. But women are worried about the next meal, the great unity. If you lose your capital, how are you going to feed your children, whether you can pay the rent and so on. So there needs to be a balance. So to me, the first thing is that thing, the, the, uh, the uh, strengthening of the family and the, and, and the, and the communication between family, yeah? especially with the family business. When, it's, when the going there, it's very hard. When you make a loss, it is the family support from your wife, your husband, from your extended family that will keep you going. And that is actually the, 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 probably the most important reason why you want to go into business. It's not to make a name for yourself, but to give a better future to your children. Uh, okay, the, 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 the second uh, core value, I think, the first one is the family. The second core value uh, to me is you have to learn how to conserve. Uh, conservation, eh? And conservation is not only about... Um, saving the trees or the, our natural resources. It's about conserving our resources. And principally in business, it comes down to money. We have to conserve our money. We don't spend all our money at once. You always keep some for a rainy day. And um, my mother always advised me that you save. But one thing you must never save on. Eh? You never save on good food. You save on uh, other things that, uh, that you can buy later, like a dress, a car, furniture. But one thing I think you should never save on is good food. Because good food leads to good health. And if you don't have good health, it is re uh, you cannot reverse it. It will be very, um, very expensive to repair, if you can. Eh? So, uh, and... and, and uh, so uh, that, that is the other resource. Eh? The conservation is conserving your health. And for those who are, do sports here, yeah, rugby or thing, one thing I've learned as I grow older, I used to think a little bit different when I was young. You know, give everything. But as I grow older, I've developed a different philosophy. And I've taught this to my children. I said, never give everything. No, never give all your energy until you need to. Eh? Because if you, I, I, I always say that you, 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 you save. You save, uh, you probably work, even if you're working all day, don't, don't work until you tie yourself out. You, you go, you go uh, my wisdom now is you go about maybe 80%. If you go 80%, the next day you will feel fresh and then you can go on. 
But I know that in, in, in for Fijian culture, it, it, it doesn't seem to that way. Eh? That's what I might notice. Eh? They like to play seven. So they, they, they like to empty that tank eh, for seven or 14 minutes. And then they don't have anything left for tomorrow. And I used to think like that when I was young. I used to... Sulian Nongumbula. Solimbula. Solimbula. So I've, I've learned that uh, you, 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 you pace yourself. Uh, you know, business or life is not a sprint. It's a, it's a marathon. Eh? And um, I don't know if you heard of a, of a, a temperament in China. He was, he was the richest man in China. He was a school teacher to Jack Ma. Eh? Yeah. And he said, by the time you're 60, but, but when you're 20, you give, give uh, you know, you, you study as hard as possible. You're a student, you learn. And then when you are 20 to uh, 30, you work for others, you learn to make mistakes. And when you're 30 to 40, you start to think, uh, when you fail, you can get up. Yeah? And 40, you know, that's in your prime. You've learned your mistakes, you've learned your failures. At 50, you start to teach uh, other people. You become a master, you teach other people. And by the time you're 60, eh, you should be still healthy, you know, to enjoy your life. You go and lie on the beach, like on, at my age now, eh, I'm, I'm mid-60s now. So I, I don't do much now, so I do the cooking at home. And I'm enjoying it. So that is about conservation. Conservation is very important, eh? Conservation uh, resources. Sometimes we have to sacrifice, and we have to learn when to empty the tank, and most of the time when to hold back. Oh, and uh, uh, so this, uh, the, 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 the fact I think is very important is to develop, uh, uh, develop capacity. Capacity is developing your, even though that you might not think that it's useful now, but you learn new skills all the time. Improve your technology. If you're doing any business where you are doing now, what you're doing now, you learn how to make it more efficient. Where before you, you used to do it in um, like one hour, you have to think how to do it in, in less than one hour. Because ultimately, a business is about competition. Eh? Business is about competition. Uh, it's, people will buy, buy your product if you can offer it at a better uh, at a cheaper price and a better quality. That's, that is it. Uh, and I remember when I, when, uh, when, I, uh, when I was farming, I used to sell my ginger to uh, Uno and uh, plus the other ginger exporters. You know, um, um, uh, Belden International. Yeah, they were experts. At that time, the, the ginger market was closed. The government only restricted it to I think to a group of 10 exporters. We were not allowed to export until the, uh, I think Mr. J uh, Joe Nadola came in becoming the Minister of Agriculture in 1987 and they opened the market. He said, oh, anybody can export. I don't have to sell my ginger to, uh, to this company to export. I can export myself. So when I started exporting, I asked, I asked, um, I started to ask the uh, importers from New Zealand. That was my first target market. But every, uh, every company that I asked for said, we already have our supplier. No, I'm sorry, you know, we already have our supplier. Uh, we are very happy with him. We, you, you, you know, you can sell your ginger to him, then he'll sell it to us. But we, but we kept knocking. And I remember one afternoon, one afternoon at about, uh, Probably one o'clock, I got a call from New Zealand asking me if I could export, the, you know, get about 100 cartons of ginger. And I said, when do you want it? I said, we want it tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. And, and they probably asked the same thing to uh, Belden or to you know too, eh? and they said, no, that's impossible. Eh? But the, the order was urgent. So I volunteered. I said, I can do it. So I went up to the farm, pulled the ginger in, uh, in the afternoon, washed it at night, packed it at uh, 3 a.m., uh, took my truck to Nandi, did all the documentation. By 7 a.m., you, know, uh, you know, it was flown to New Zealand by probably 10 a.m., they had the ginger. So that was my breakthrough. 
Yeah, but that was because I had the capacity to do it. And I had the capacity because of my youth. And my wife was helping me. Whereas you know, or the other one who works for it, he couldn't do it. So sometimes you need to have that capacity in reserve. So when the opportunity comes, you know, you can fire your, uh, your rocket. And sometimes you only need that, that break. And developing capacity also means about building your, your network, your money, your network, your skills, your factory um, thing, your factory capacity, and so on. So I've talked about three core values there, which is the family support, the, the need to know when to conserve and when to empty your tank, and, uh, and, and developing that capacity. Some people are very impatient, you know? They, when they, when I, I know when I graduated, I, I thought I knew everything, you know, about farming, because I, had a, you know, I got a distinction from the agricultural college. I view I knew more than other farmers. One, one or two. Yeah, <laughs> but, the, but the most dangerous thing which I have learned uh, in business is the things that you don't know that you don't know. Those are very dangerous. You don't know that you don't know. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years ago, the, one of the companies, one of the government uh, companies, they wanted to export the popo to, uh, to, I think, to New Zealand. So they thought, just bring the popo, pack it in the carton, and ship it. And then I asked them, no, you, uh, I said, well, where are you going to do your, your heat treatment? HFTA, they, they call it the heat treatment, you know? And the, the manager said, what is that? <laughs> yeah. Because he, did, he didn't know what he didn't know. And that could lead to many disasters. Yeah. I've, uh, I've, I have people coming to me now, even now. I said they wanted to plant ginger. Ginger, you know? They, were, they, they said they want to plant ginger. And I said, no, you don't plant ginger now. You plant ginger in September. You know? <laughs> so they don't know that they don't know. So, so a lot of things we don't know that we don't know. So, so it's very important to take time. Take time to, uh, you know, to get that experience. That sometimes I find it's very dangerous to employ somebody uh, new into the industry that he doesn't, uh, you know, that he's got plenty of idea, plenty ideas, but he don't know. There's so many complications there. I see that in, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, corporate, uh, cooperative executives, eh? because they're good in pressing buttons, not their money. So after they lose about a uh, million dollars, then uh, they go reverse. But when you tell them something, they, they think they know it all. So, and the last video I think is very important is to have this, uh, uh, to have a, 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 a broad vision. When I used to talk about a broad vision before, we used to think about geography, you know? You know, like, because, uh, because we, we, I was in Lomaibuna. Then my boundary extended to Suba. And then it went to uh, maybe Lotoka. Then it went uh, to Australia. Then went to Asia and, and so on. So, the, so, but now I think it's more than that now. It's not about geography. It's about the, the possibilities of new technology transforming uh, society. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about, um, we have to be aware of the trends of the trends that is coming. I noticed in uh, government, the Ministry of Commerce, the FTIB, they, they, they're talking a lot about the, what, the call centers in Fiji. You know, that's going to be a big uh, industry. But I think they're a little bit behind now because uh, the call centers, I believe, in another five to 10 years will be obsolete because all those will be taken over by uh, machines. Machines will be taking so many jobs now. When you look at, the, uh, 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 the, for instance, in Australia, about the energy from coal and oil, all that will be replaced by renewables. When you talk about uh, livestock, there's laboratory meat coming in now. And there's so many things that once you think that your resource, like a feed, is very unique, or, for, or if, you, if, you, if you think that you are a Angona farmer, um, and you think the Ingona is very unique in Fiji. But in 10 years' time, that could be grown in many other places in the world. 
Uh, the, I noticed uh, people are growing a lot of uh, yassi, yassi trees now because it's so valuable. But in 20 years' time, you know, it could be very different. So the technologies will transform, uh, transform things that, uh, that uh, you did not plan for. And uh, if you recall that song by John Lennon, there's a line there. It said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. <laughs> and, in, uh, and so now plans have to be quickly uh, adapted. Eh? It's not like before, we can write a plan and then you can do it over 10 years. I think it's no longer the case now. If you look at a lot of companies now, they've actually gone bankrupt. Big companies like Nokia. Uh, bought over by uh, 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 Blackberry, uh, the cam uh, the what's all the camera? Olympus camera. Uh, there's so many that have gone. So, so if you think your 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 wherever you what you're doing now is unique, you know you you watch out what the other people are doing and what the trends are. So that's why it's very important to have this wide vision. So. So. So I've, I've mentioned those four things, and uh, and la and lastly, uh, this is uh, uh, lastly. Let, let, let me uh, you, know, you know it already, eh? but uh, I think uh, I think late last year I went and gave a talk here to the MBA class, Master of Business Administration down in the thing, and they asked me to just to come and uh, give a lecture on business, and I, uh, I told the. Uh, Coronator there, well, your students, uh, you know, got all the textbooks. What do I have to tell them? No, you just come and tell me something unique that uh, is probably not in our textbooks. So I thought about it for a while. So I went up and addressed the students. I told them, see, I've, I've come here because I think most of your, you know, most of the things that uh, are already in textbook. But today, I think I'll, I'll say something that's probably not in your textbooks. So they were all attentive. I said, the title of my talk today is how to do business in a world full of crooks. <laughs> because, out in the, because out in the real world there, nothing is straight. Every day, somebody will try to manipulate you or cheat you, uh, con you. Uh, and I have plenty of experiences. And uh, I actually suggested to the MBA classes for them to do uh, to write uh, you know uh, write uh, do some assignments eh? on uh, the various ways people call each other in Fiji. And I can tell you a very story from buying Dalo, and Ghana, from uh, factories and so on. So out in the real world, all those plans somebody can. Um, yeah, can, uh, can put it into reverse gear if you're not careful. So I think that's, um, I think just generally that's, uh, that's what, those are the values I like to share. But uh, I know you asked me to, to uh, talk about my life uh, uh, business, so. And Marco Polo, how did it start? Marco Polo. Oh, Marco Polo. Okay. Um, okay, let me. Uh, well, one thing led to another. Eh? This is one thing. It's uh, because we are a family business. Everything is, uh, a lot of times, uh, our business plans depend on our family circumstances. Mm. You know, if the wife is agreeable and happy on something, we go on that path. If, uh, if, we meet, uh, if, we, if we meet a friend and uh, he said, hey, I, I, you know, uh, uh, this is a good business idea, and you trust him, you might want to follow that way. Yeah, for a lot of family business, it's not about uh, actually employing somebody to write a business plan. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of times it's like that. Eh? Like uh, when, you, when you are... Uh, I think my business is probably based as on my background as a farmer, you know? A farmer wakes up in the morning, and if the sun is shining and the, you know, the, you know and you feel energetic, you go and plow up your field or dig up your field. And you're not sure what you're gonna plant yet, but you just feel energetic, you plow it up. Yeah, yeah. You know? You plow it up. And then if you feel tired, you stop. 
And after you've, uh, after you've uh, plowed up your field, then you think, oh, maybe I should put some dollar in today. Mm. Or put some uh, thing based on the technical capabilities. Eh? Yeah. So that's basically the story of how I did things. So when I was growing ginger, uh, to add value, I, I wanted to export. Export the, to export the, the, and other farmers asked me to export. And at that time, I remember, when I started my ginger factory, I did not know much. So I, I was very lucky, I managed to get it right. For first uh, first uh, try. There's a couple of other people who tried it, but that failed. Eh? And um, I remember way back in 1990s, before the age of the internet, the way I got my market, I used to go to the British Embassy or the Australian Embassy and get their phone book. And I used to look in the phone book there in England. And I look at the importer. So I call uh, Mr. Sims, or I remember a guy, Mr. Sims. And I used to call him at about one o'clock in the morning. A fiji time, because that was uh, about one o'clock uh, uh, working time in England. Yeah. And the charge at that time, I think, was about seven dollars one minute. <laughs> so I used to dial up the secretary, and I was a bit shy too. Eh? Mm. So I used to call up. I said, can I talk to the boss, uh, managing director? I said, what do you want? I'm calling from Fiji. I want to talk to him if I can sell him some uh, ginger. I got some sample here which I can send to him. <coughs> then he said, Mr. Sims is a bit busy now. Can you hold on? I said, I'll hold on. So I hold on for about uh, three, four minutes. I look, see, it's about $30 already. Uh. And then the secretary would tell me, Mr. Sims is still busy. Do you want to hold on or do you want to call back? And I'm thinking, if I drop the phone now and he just managed to get free, I've wasted $30 already. Yeah. But if I hold on, he might go for another 10 minutes. I'll be paying about $150 or something. Eh? <laughs> So that was the time at that time. Now it's so easy with the internet. You can send pictures, you can communicate. Yeah. So that, that was uh, that time. Uh, and I went down to New Zealand with my ginger. I remember when I was a crystallized ginger. I, I went and knocked the door on the door. And I said, I'm so and so, and I want to show you some ginger. So, uh, and some people are very rude. Eh? Mm. <laughs> very rude. They said, We are not interested. Mm. Yeah? We are not interested. Yeah? So you just have to go to the next one and knock again. And, they, and then I remember one guy, uh, G.S. Linton. He said, oh, come in. Mm. Yeah, he gave me a cup. He said, this guy's a friendly guy. So we started business that way. But sometimes you have to knock on many doors. And if, and if, uh, if you're a shy person, it's very, very um, frightening, like I was doing. Because remember, I, I came from Lomaybun. I never see many white men. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> that time when you were young, in the colonial time, when we see a white man coming, we go to the side of the road. Yeah. So when I went to New Zealand, I saw it was all white people. And I was a little bit uh, scared because we're not sure our English is uh, good yeah. or, you know, so on. But like I said, it's a journey. So you go on that step and then you go to the next one and then uh, next one. And then, um, so that was, that was how I started in the, you know, finding markets for ginger and dalo. Um, um, when I started my uh, ginger factory in, uh, in, uh, in Wailanda, I actually, I, I, I actually, because I did not know that I had the expertise, I actually wrote to a big company in Australia, which was Budnam Ginger, ginger at that time. Yeah? I wrote to them, I said, I'm starting, uh, I'd like to start a ginger factory in Fiji, and I've got a lot of farmers here. Uh, do you want to come and partner with me? Eh? I think they came over and saw what I was doing, and they look at me, and they laugh. And this is the story they told me later. They said, then they laugh. They said, oh, we look at you, and we thought, you were, you were stupid, crazy. You're never going to do it. <laughs> but one year later, I, was, uh, I built a ginger factory, and I was taking their market. You know? And they offered to buy 50% of my factory. You know? And then later on, and then I sat on the board in their factory in Australia. They, they, at that time, they called themselves the world's biggest ginger factory. So when I sat on their board in Australia, I realized that the things that I was doing was just almost the same as what they were doing. And I told them, you know, I said, I thought you had some very advanced techniques. And they told me, no, that's what we thought, uh, that's what we want the world to know. 
But it was the same thing that I was doing that they were doing. <laughs> yeah. So, and then after, then later on, I sold the ginger factory in Lamy, and then I, I bought the land in uh, Raiwai. And that's how I got that land in Raiwai. That time it was very, uh, it's actually a very, uh, what, what they call, a very rough neighborhood. Eh? For those who grew up in Suva, you know, Raiwanga, Raiwai, uh, that area was a very rough neighborhood. And when I bought it, people actually told me that uh, I, I did the wrong thing because they said this area is no, not a good area. Yeah. You made a big mistake. Mm. But uh, I, I, I really didn't know that. Eh? I, the, the only thing I thought was that's a good area because it's close to the National Stadium. I said, if I come from Lomaibuna, I can park my big truck there and come and watch rugby <laughs> and then go back. That, that was uh, what was in my mind. And then sometimes they say, uh, you know, in business, if you, if, you, if you analyze too much, you get par uh, paralysis. Because I remember other people were also uh, wanting to buy that uh, place. Yeah? But they were analyzing a lot of oh, things. Eh? Right, yeah. And maybe sometimes you are lucky because you just do, you, you become a little bit stupid. Yeah. Just like when I went farming after graduation, eh? a lot of people... Uh, uh, told me that was <laughs> that was a stupid idea. idea because you already graduated, eh? Yeah, I already graduated. It was hard in the beginning yeah. uh, because um, because I had to. Go, uh, I know most of you come from the rural area, but you know, like uh, in the rural area, when you come out uh, for market day, we come we come out at about one o'clock on Thursday. Eh? One o'clock on Thursday, we go to the market to so if you come early there to get the space. If you come like uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, other farmers have taken your space. Mm. So we come at 1 o'clock in the morning, mm. put our dollar there, you know, cover it with a tarpaulin and wait until early in the morning. And if it's raining, we'll just go on the veranda there and uh, drink some grog with the other farmers. <laughs> so we did that for many years. And then, uh, and then we go home again on Saturday about... Uh, Probably about 7 p.m. Eh? 7 p.m. We loaded the, the three-ton uh, truck with some of the leftover bundle of Dalo or whatever. And then, I, then all the villagers from Dalo and Malay and Loma Vuna are coming in my truck. So I asked to go and drop them off first in uh, class sector six. Where I come up. When I come home, it was like 11 o'clock. <laughs> and then I have to work again on Sunday because I have to you know, pull things. But when you're young, you can do it. Eh? Like now, if you tell me to do it now, I can't. <laughs> so I've talked for a long time, so maybe some questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yi Wan Singh. Um, um, I think uh, the people here really enjoyed your, your story, you know, how you uh, talked about your, your humble beginnings, eh? And as a farmer and how you grew up. All right, uh, it's question time, uh, please. <laughs> I think most uh, there's a lot of farmers out there, you know, who are really interested to, to actually learn a lot about uh, about export. Uh, Mr. Wasing has been exporting uh, for a long, long time now, probably about 20 years or so, right? Mr. Wasing, yeah, Bulubinaka, go. Oh, 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 wrong with you, you and uh, program I cut Oh, yeah. Nia warita kina usin menerongat sarap goti. Tolong anak kau nikila. Dalo jinja nampak skill. Aku kira kira ubi arongat ya. Ia balik lembu na terang tu teringgi oleh lembu na kaya. Ia tu 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 lembu ni profesor saya tapi. Ia usang tu wadah na tu na biar. Ia usin lembu na kau kila. Aku kila ngan aku ten dalo. Eh, eh. Na jinja, yoko nambah skilling ko, do nangau ni, do nangau ni ando sambo, kala, ando bito nambah skilling, do pon nambah skilling wabu kicu ko, ando lawang pon sana nambah suve lotoka, suve bingorin, lo mai pun ada listel mai, do teleta walim na pon nambah skilling. Ya nak kan ibu wali kan boleh untuk tu nabi rasul sini ke kuni buat tu nabi wali pun nabi kan boleh uklang ah lelengan lelengan nak uklang. Ya, 
Yo me lo me pone a ngonea se ngoni sala ngerger eh yo Ngo sa sa pinang sa ngoni sala eh Sa le lembang ana ore da ngo sa 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 pinang sa ngoni sala yo sa kono pe bono ke da mai waimba lo me bono sa sa le le mena tete yo yo Hundred twenty three thousand net. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasi. Uh, one of the essential core, the last one uh, that really intrigued me to ask this question, probably if you can, was uh, as an entrepreneur, you need to have a broad vision. Eh? You've alluded to the fact that this is all that is needed. Eh? And one thing that I really had taken me, in, especially in farming, I'm interested in farming as well. Eh? Uh, food is a fuel for everyone. You need to eat and then to get energized. So one of it is looking in the, what I've seen that you've looked in the 20 years time and you are uh, planting a crop or something, then you have managed that technology will take over some of these produce. Eh? So from, uh, if I can just ask you, what is the commodity or what do you think that we should start generating more now or because technology is coming. Hmm. So what I, uh, what probably you may not ask or answer or you would have suggestion or give us leeways so that we start, don't look into the five years. We should start, like you mentioned, 20 years time, technology is coming. They will replace some, might, the other will become artificial or something. Technology is ever growing, eh? So what is the commodity? What do you think that we have resources we can look into and tap onto that? Okay. Well, I, th I think the potential is in the local market. Because if you look at the exports, and I, I know there's a lot of um, talk about exports and so on, but the, the, the fact is that in, in Fiji, our productive capacity is very low. Eh? We are not very competitive. I know there is a tapioca growers uh, association or something, they're talking about the cassava and so on. Um, but, uh, but the cost of uh, producing cassava in Fiji, even though cassava is the be uh, Fiji is the best place to grow cassava, our, our, our method of production and our, um, our discipline in producing it makes our prices very high. I remember going into Thailand, they, they, they do about uh, probably what, half a million to one million tons of cassava. And at that time in 1995, they were selling cassava for about five cents Fijian, one million ton. In Fiji, nobody will work for five cents a kilo. Eh? Right now, the cassava probably one dollar a kilo. Eh? But of course, the, the market is, is uh, in Fiji. It's very profitable uh, to do cassava if you do it well here. If you look at all the Chinese farmers, uh, not now, but 1980s, 1990s, so when they're coming to Fiji, in China, they grow rice. But when they come to Fiji, eh, they grow cassava. It's very profitable. Um, when, when, when I was farming, the price of, uh, you know, the price of a pineapple, I remember selling four pineapple, big ones, for, for one dollar. One dollar bundle of four. Now I go to the market, I find that it's about two dollars for one small pineapple, maybe five dollars for, for a big one. So to me, if you, if you are, if you are in, in, but of course, where you're growing in Fiji depends on your second, whether you've got labor, where, uh, where you're, we, uh, the suitability of your land, the, uh, the, the closeness of the market. But to me, the general principle is that uh, don't, grow, don't grow too big an area, but double your yield from the same area. And this is my, also my uh, advice, I guess, to the Ministry of Agriculture and all that, because they go out on all these uh, uh, programs trying to, uh, to do 
to do uh, extension service to uh, interest people to grow. But when I look at what uh, what is actually being produced, like our, our milk uh, can cows, we're getting about 4.5 liter per cow per day. Eh? You know, in New Zealand, they kill their uh, cow at when the thing dropped to 15 liters. Because the normal production is about 25 to 30 liters. When it drops to 15 liters, the cow is no longer economical. And here we are milking cows at 15, uh, sorry, 4.5 or 4 liters per day. Uh, the same thing, uh, see, what, what, I, what I find is very interesting now, uh, and you talk about advances, eh? is that our, 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 our yields, our, our productive capacity uh, uh, from the 1960s where we grow big bananas and all, has actually dropped. Like for rice, for instance, rice, eh? our, uh, uh, when the farm, or cane, or rice, when, okay, rice, uh, before we were doing like uh, maybe one, two tons per acre. Two tons, but now it's uh, dropped down to maybe, if you look at the rice now, maybe one and a half ton per acre, one ton per acre. And in China, no, they were probably at four ton per acre, and now it's gone to like eight ton per acre, eight ton per acre in Asia. In New Zealand, uh, we, were, we were doing it in, in the 60s when the, um, no, Tom Gedward and all this were doing uh, milk in the Thailand and all that. The milk production probably about seven to eight liters per day. And New Zealand was probably about 12, 15, eh? but because of the technology, genetic, um, and, and uh, b b breeding and uh, uh, nutrition and all the agriculture sciences, New Zealand has gone up to 30. And we've gone down to 4.5. So we, lo we have lost our comparative advantage. It's almost like everything, ginger. I remember when I started growing ginger, Fiji ginger was called the Fiji fancy. Only Hawaiian Fiji could produce those ginger, big ones like this. Now our ginger has come small like this, and you go to China now, the ginger in China, you know, is big like this. <laughs> that is because of the agricultural research and the farmer's uh, discipline, husbandry, and so on. Yeah, so the, and the main thing is we have to double our yield. Whatever you're doing, like if you're doing Angona, uh, and, and you're getting, I, I don't know what the normal yield for Angona, maybe one and a half, uh, one and a half kilo per Angona. We have to learn how to make it to uh, three, three kilos. And, and also because your, your production. When I, when I was farming, my target to plant Andalo a day, manually, yeah, was to do 1,300 Andalo a day. Yeah? You know, 1,300. Now I hear people, they said, uh, you know, they come and boast to me that they are planting uh, 200 a day. <laughs> 200 a day. If you're planting 200 a day and I was selling dollar at that time for 30 cents a kilo, you will be making a loss. So I have to learn how to do 1,300 a day, uh, one man, myself. It's productivity. Thank you, Mr. Washing. Uh, I think that is dedication and commitment. Eh? Just my last question to you. How do you manage your time with family, with farming, and you know, coming to take calls to England, knocking on the doors? You know, you have a business, you have a family, and you are now, uh, I would tell is a tycoon in Fiji, a very entrepreneur, and uh, that's really impressive to me. And whether, do you sleep? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I think the first 10 years, I hardly had any sleep. I remember I worked seven days a week, me and my wife, including Sundays. Eh? I, I used to go to the farm, uh, <laughs> Work in the day, came back uh, to, to, to the packing shack, packed the ginger at night. I drove it to Nandi with my baby in the front seat. Uh, unload the thing and drove back and slept on the road and maybe halfway to Singatoka, came back, drove to the farm again. And I was doing that for 10 years. And my wife and I just talked uh, yesterday. I said, we really felt sorry for our kids. Because we had no time for them, eh? no time. The younger ones, the, one, the, the youngest one, we had time. But the first... Uh, and this is a story, I think, to a lot of immigrant families. If you look at the rise of China now, where they are now, where, where, you know, when I, my wife came from China, when she came from China in the 1980s, uh, the wages in China at that time, where she was in our province, was about $1,000 a year. $1,000 a year. And my, my wife never saw her parents. 
You go out at night, I came back. Everybody was doing that, the whole country. But look after one generation. The average wage in China, in my province now, is probably like $50,000 a year. Yeah? And in Fiji, we're still on about maybe $10,000 or $12,000 a year. So it's a big difference because of the work of, of one, the sacrifice of... Uh, but I tell you, everything that you do, the only thing you must not uh, sacrifice is your health. Because your time, you can stop watching rugby, uh, you know, you'll be okay because you can watch uh, rugby later. But one thing you must never, never, I always tell this to my children. One thing you must never forego is your health, good food. So at my age now, I'm, I, I still run about 40 kilometers a week, you know, because I, I, uh, I'm very lucky that, um, you know, I, 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 um, I did not abuse myself. Eh? Uh, when I was young, I worked hard, but I ate uh, properly, maybe a little bit of uh, less sleep. And, uh, and, I, and I tell you the thing, you have to find a good wife. Or if you, you not find a good wife, but your, if your wife is, uh, if your wife uh, looks after you, you'll be okay. Um, Mr. Wasing, Bulubinakam. Uh, yeah. Oh. Bulubinaka, Mr. Wasing. Um, I think I, for one, that I've heard about you during, even since my school days, up in, uh, when I spent my time up in Lumebuna with my families. At that time, they were ginger, or they were just planting ginger, and you were helping them. Uh, um, my cousin, them, with the, in their education. And I thank you for that. Um, my question is, um, I haven't heard about you uh, talking about your investment. You have been doing this about 20, more than almost 30 years now. Um, what is your advice to us on our investment? Uh, when we get profit, for me, I've just started my business. I've started to get profit. So I think the problem for us is keeping aside profit. Where do we invest? For example, like pigeon holding in a trust. I understand that you've purchased properties. You must have been investing for so many years now. So can you tell us about your, um, your secret? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, well actually I'm not an investor. I'm not, I'm not actually a real businessman. Because I think a businessman is someone like who, who got this X amount of money and they want a maximum return on it. Eh? And I think you've got professional people who are doing that. Uh, for me, I, I one first thing I try not to lose money. <laughs> That's the first thing I think as an investor you must do is try not to lose money. And then uh, a lot of people come to ask me, uh, and, and I'm sorry, this might be this might be a little bit of a bad joke. You know, uh, and they tell me I want to. Uh, what, what shall I do with my money? And uh, I told him, well, um, for me, it's very easy. I just give it to my wife. <laughs> and then some people say, oh, no. <laughs> but uh, I think the first thing, um, first thing you have to have some reserve. You must have some reserve. Because you see, there are natural disasters and there are health, uh, health, uh, no? Uh, there'll be health issues and the hospital may be not able to look after you in Fiji as, as uh, well now. So you have to have that reserve that if, if for any day, if you need to have an operation or something, you must have that for your education of your, of your children. I think those are the priority. Eh? Uh, 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 like I said, the health, the reserve for your health, uh, education, and also I think it's very important for your, for your house. In Chinese, we have a tradition. If you don't have a house, the girl won't marry you. Uh, that's, that's very true in China now. So there's a lot of pressure for young people to actually save to that house. I think they tried that to do that in Fiji. There was a legislation, something like that. And then the people say, no, that's against our human rights. So <laughs> indigenous. But, uh, uh, but once you got up to a selfless uh, funds, at the moment, it changes from time to time. Eh? But at the moment, if you look at the, the property market, uh, the returns are not there. And I feel sorry for a lot of people who invested in property. 
because there's a lot of empty apartments. Every investment has a risk. Eh? Uh, term deposits are very low now. If you put money into the bank now, it's about one and a half percent uh, term deposit. Um, uh, and in Fiji, you are restricted from investing overseas. Um, uh, I, I can tell you where not to put your money, <laughs> but uh, where to put your money is, it depends on how much money you have. But, uh, but I, think, I, think, I think the main thing at, the, at this moment during this COVID-19 economy uh, is protect our assets, protect, play very safe. Uh, don't, don't buy anything unnecessary. Uh, uh, because a lot of people actually want to offload their business now to you. <laughs> I know plenty of restaurants are wanting to sell. Eh? From 120,000, they've dropped it down to 50,000. Because they're losing money. And then they, they will try to come and entice you if you have money to come and uh, buy their business. You have to be very careful. <coughs> Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Oh, Hussing. Oh, oh, sorry. We, we thank God for having people like you, <coughs> uh, hardworking. Uh, you talked about uh, <coughs> the decrease in yields eh, over the years, whether it's milk, uh, it's uh, other agro products. <coughs> uh, this is my observation. <coughs> and I hope uh, people who work for government are here to listen to what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> my observation is this. All governments, from Ratumbara to Ratu Sitiveni to Ratu Lesenia, now to Ratumbai, <coughs> they have only been concentrating, pouring uh, uh, hundreds of millions into the sugar industry. As for the other crops, they hardly pour money into this. Uh, that could be one factor. <coughs> Sugar industry is declining and declining, yet they're pouring money into the sugar industry every time. <clears throat> I'd like to see an increase the amount that is poured to other, especially agro products. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, sometimes uh, I'm tempted to think uh, that uh, the degree causes in agriculture that USP or FNU is offering is hardly producing goods. Because uh, it has been my observation too that the yields are just decreasing, decreasing. <clears throat> and most of our friends uh, who have graduated from agriculture, most of them when coming out, they are not interested to jump, to go and till the land. We see them uh, jumping to FDB we want to see the evidence of the degree. We want to see the evidence of degree uh, that they have got. <clears throat> so to USP person who are here, Brother Semi, uh, this is what we'd like to see. We'd like uh, to see the evidence of those degrees there on the land, <clears throat> in tilling the land. <clears throat> um, I hope that there would be more value adding than to agro-based uh, products. Eh? <clears throat> because what has been uh, seen now, we continue to be importing most of the products that can be produced locally. Uh, for example, <clears throat> there's a nice potato called red Pontiac potato that used to be produced in the hills of uh, Nandrau, uh, Nandala, <clears throat> uh, I was teaching up in the Highlands, and uh, my students used to come down from, Nandra, from Nandrao after weekends, and they bring uh, these uh, red Pontiac potatoes. And when I go up to Tavua, I used to see some traders there saying, oh, are he alu, he alu about karab, alu is, uh, is potatoes. <clears throat> my observation is this, people, have rubbish what is produ produced locally so that they will continue to be importing. And we'd like uh, to see the government not only encouraging us uh, to produce, produce, no agriculture people, eh? they go around, tay, 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 tay. 
But when all these uh, products produced from the TT come and meet together in Suba, the agriculture people are lost. So these people become discouraged and they go back to their villages. And the KVT has been labeled as Wudesa people. <clears throat> that is not true. They are just not silly people <clears throat> to continue producing and the markets are not there for them. I think I'll just uh, yeah, stop there. Yeah, my, uh, yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that, that question is uh, more about um, policies and all that. My, my, just my brief um, uh, observation is um, uh, our, 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 like I said earlier, our economy is, uh, people like to talk uh, Fiji as uh, agricultural economy, but the fact is our agriculture, uh, agriculture only contributes less than 7% towards the GDP. 7%. It used to be much higher, maybe 30 to 40. But now tourism is about 30 and uh, uh, agriculture is about 7%. The problem in Fiji, it, it's a catch-22 situation. Eh? And, uh, and, and this is goes with general, um, general things. Eh? Because in Fiji, most of the things we grow here are, are grown so easily. Like a cassava, you can just throw it and it grows. So we don't need much effort to do, to, uh, to grow anything. So it becomes like a, uh, like a, a, a subsistence system. Eh? But th that is not good enough for the export market or even for processing because we don't have the consistency. See, my ginger factory in Lamy, I used to import, I used to grow a thousand tons of ginger with my farmers here. But I wanted to do 2,000 tons of ginger. And I go to the farmers and I get it, but I can't get it. So to tell you the secret, I used to import about five to 600 tons from China. Ginger from China to Fiji, already sliced to process, but I use all the Fiji sugar. But I want like uh, three to 4,000 tons. Because uh, like I said, because our, 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 uh, our Fijian uh, system is very subsistence based. Eh? And then uh, they, they can grow maybe three to four square chain very well. So when I see a farmer that's very promising, I tell him, hey, you go mate sana you go na dau te jinja bit man the tol neck when they do three acre they can look after it because there are many obligations and so on and 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 then uh, then whatever they they were doing well for three square chain they 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 get uh, they actually doing a lot of effort for nothing because then they can't pull the weeds and so on eh? so from my observation is that there's a certain um, a sweet spot that uh, people can do. So always say, you start with, uh, say, one acre of dalo, next year you do another acre of dalo, but instead of trying to do two acres, that one acre of dalo, instead of getting seven ton, you'd get ten ton. You know, you spend more time on it. You'll find, you'll get the bias will come to you, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have plenty of time for community things and so on, instead of trying to do so many things. Uh, uh, so because so that, that, that is the limiting factor of uh, processing, eh? because we want to do more, but uh, we don't have the supply. The, the, uh, but being entrepreneurs like ourselves now, this is a good opportunity. Because you you will you'll be the you'll buy the whole village. And then, uh, by your example, uh, they might uh, want to catch up with you. That's uh, because I look at back in life. If I was a young man now, I, I, I would be farming. Because when I go to the market and I see the price of watermelon, I used to sell watermelon for 25 cents a kilo. Now I go to the market, I see that $2.50 one kilo. Uh, $20 one watermelon. Before, the biggest watermelon I can sell, maybe $5. Yeah, it's, and uh, one, uh, one good used to be $50. Now it's like $300. It's, uh, that's because more people uh, are watching video games on their phone or whatever. <laughs> and, and, and to me, and, and to me uh, uh, was it your question or your question? Eh? Now, about agriculture doing more things. To me, the knowledge is all there. The, the, the knowledge of uh, production, although it's maybe the technology from the 70s or 80s, uh, we can use the same thing that we know. I mean, even your grandfather knew it. Eh? 
If you apply those things, your dollar will be much bigger. Um, because I, I look at, uh, even now when I'm doing other things, a lot of people ask me about things. I said the secret is not uh, like good health or... I said all the nutrition information is there. But the, the, the problem in Fiji is not that we, are, we don't know. Uh, the problem in Fiji is not that we are not educated. I think we are overeducated. The problem in Fiji is that we are not disciplined to apply. To apply, eh? Like uh, everybody knows the packet of cigarette, the big uh, letter there, eh? with a uh, what? With a uh, with a lungs of uh, full of uh, black uh, uh, thing there. But people look at it, they know it. Even though they know it, they still smoke. So to, so to me, uh, knowledge, knowledge is, uh, people always say education, eh? uh, may, may, uh, more education, more training. I, I look at it, I say no. People already know it. They're just going to the training so they can, uh, you know, sit uh, there to Talanoa. But uh, they already know because when they come out, they don't apply. Oh, Humphrey. Brother Wasing. I uh, I am going to introduce myself first because no, no, I didn't it. hear anybody introduce themselves. I am Humphrey Chang. I am the president of the small Fiji Chamber of SME. There's a few things that I want to bring up uh, in relation to your talk there, Wasing. Yeah. And that is, if I start from the loan side, you say that when you are new, Nobody wants to know you, but I can tell you, when you are old, there are also people who don't know, want to know you. <laughs> <laughs> that is because, I'll tell you one story. I have applied for a loan with FDB. I don't know if FDB is here or not today, but tomorrow they will be here and I will hammer them. <laughs> and, and I have applied for a loan now going nine months and still not approved. So, what is old? Yeah, old is gold, but... <laughs> One more thing. You have not mentioned something that I like farmers to do. I'm a semi-farmer, but I think I know something that a lot of people do not know. And I will say something that you do the things that you do not know, but you know. <laughs> okay. People in Fiji does not know how to plant cassava. Some might say, I've been planting cassava for 10 years, but I can tell you, they don't know how to plant cassava. Come and see me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Another thing, people want to do things their own way. But here, people do not, you, you talk about re geography, and you say to find out new ways of doing things, and I call, it, I call that research. <coughs> Farmers in Fiji is not doing the right thing. What they, all the farmers do in Fiji is when do they work? Daytime, yeah? Wrong. You should work by night and sleep by day. <laughs> and if you want to know what tools I got for that, I got it. Come and see me. Thank you. Maybe we'll take one last question, please. Eh? Just one last question. Mr. Wasing, one last, one last question. Sir, thank you. Um, I'm Salote. Um, was in the education uh, field, but I learned that education is putting what you have here and in your heart into action. But I, I have a few comments uh, about the agriculture product and especially the nature fresh product. We uh, tend to look at this product in a different uh, perspective. 
We'd rather pay hundreds of dollars for imported goods that only add to NCD than buy fresh nature uh, grown uh, food here in Fiji. And we, we run a food delivery company, so we are running Dandalo that's from the land to the houses. And this is what the families are saying. So live on Dandalo. Eh? So this is what I always let them know. You'd rather buy your joski and all this that adds to your ill health than take something that will add to the freshness to your family. Uh, we need to change that perspective and I think every organization that's here that's promoting our local produce need to flash that on the media. They need to promote good nature fresh food so these farmers, as we've heard, will have a reason to plant more for everyone else. It's because we value a tin tuna better than our fresh fish. That's why all these uh, resources are dying out. And much can be done from the education level. I was a teacher, also a principal at a school, where every career planning is on a job that's only limited to a few. And I'm grateful for Mr. Humphrey here that asked us principal at one time, why are you inviting the lecturers and professors? They are not hiring you when it's time for your graduation. You need to invite the business people who are the employers for your children's career. So we need to change the education system to see our farming as our way of eating and earning our food despite you have a salary job or wages job. We need to raise that back to square one and that begins with all of us in our house. And I know for those of us in the Christian faith, we, we hear this in sermon, but how many of us really go out and put our fingers into that ground to produce for our family? Or do we just sit and wait for the paycheck? When COVID-19 came, we all knew the land. It's in us. We need to do that. Whatever businesses we're running, we need to go back to the land. And he has shared, he's an immigrant, and came here to do exactly what we should have been doing as our forefathers have been doing. Let's say hooray to agriculture, and let's teach our children to plant, beginning from kindergarten all the way up to form seven. Have that degree, but it's going to be a toilet paper soon. When you retire, that degree is gone. You're going to come back to Mother Earth. Let's say yay to Mother Earth, Naka. Uh, thank you for that comment. I just said the last comment. Eh? You know, one, one of the things we are very lucky in Fiji is that we live in a very uh, gentle, a very um, abundant environment. Eh? I, I remember a story way back in 2008 when the financial uh, crisis in uh, America eh? and they were slacking off people from Detroit. And, and, and this, uh, this guy's son was working in America. So the, the boss of the uh, car making company called the uh, workers uh, in, uh, mainly Mexicans and from, you know, some people from uh, Latin America, and he was the only Fijian. So we called in the Mexicans in and he said, sorry, we have to close down the factory for a while because there's no demand for the cars. So the Me Mexicans were very worried. They were crying. He said they go back to their village in the drylands of uh, Mexico, they don't know how to feed their family. But when he called the Fijian uh, boy in to tell him, he said, uh, we have to slack you off for a while. I don't know, maybe six months. Uh, no job. You might have to go back to your home or village and, and wait. And that Fijian boy broke into a smile. The manager saw how happy it was. He said, what's, what's uh, up with you? Oh, everybody's worried, but you were very happy. He said, I'm going back to my island of Kandab. He said, what are you going to eat? He said, if you come to my village, eh, you will know there's nothing to worry about. 
And then in Fiji, the main thing in Fiji, we have blessed us that's pulling us through now, through our COVID-19 crisis, unemployment and uh, lack of government resources, is the community support and the, and the resources we have our land. But one thing I fear very much is that a lot of the resources in the village, the water, the, uh, the trees, the, the natural uh, fauna, the prawns, eh? uh, uh, the food from the forest is being depleted. And to me, if we don't do anything else, we have to protect what's, uh, you know, and, and uh, increase the abundance of the village because that will carry us through. And in, uh, in Singapore, if anybody of you fly up in Singapore, I'll just say this one more and then I go. Just to, just to mention that uh, we did not to be worried. If you fly over to Singapore, you look down all those skyscrapers in Hong Kong. It's a high maintenance city. Electricity, water, the food, the train, servicing. If people go to sleep there for, and, and if people go to sleep there for one month, the whole city will be a disaster. People will die by the millions. In Fiji, you go to Kandavu or to Lao or to Wanolev. If, if you go to sleep for two years and wake up, everything will still be there. I think the, the goat will be grazing gracefully, the lot of grass, the fish will be more. We're very lucky. And I remember the president of China in, uh, I think, 15, 20 years ago, he came to Fiji and he saw how abundant it was. And he said, you are very lucky in Fiji. This is one place in Fiji you can think slowly. And he meant it as a compliment. Sometimes we are slow because, uh, sometimes we are slow. We don't need to hurry because there's so much, uh, so much um, uh, abundance in our land. But that is one thing I've seen that is actually being, um, being depleted. Eh? I, I, I went out to the Rolida, the, the woman to go and get prawn before with a tala tala come. One hour he can get the prawn, you know, for Sunday. Now he has to maybe do Four hours, it's harder to catch. So th th this is the thing that I, that, because I know a lot of you come from the rural area. This is one thing that we need to protect, the, um, the, the village, the village uh, resources, replanting, the skills. Yeah, and don't worry about the thing, because once you get that right, once you've got that right, you can travel the world. You can travel the world, you can take risk, because we fail over there in New Zealand, if you fail in Suba, you go back to your, your traditional uh, reserves, you have food there. For many communities, and I, and I, and I, and I get um, calls every day from, uh, uh, from the Indian um, uh, uh, boys down in the, you know, some settlements here, because they've left their, they've left their, the rural area, everybody there, the uncle, the father, all in Suba now, some in um, other places, but no more in the rural area. They call me desperate looking for a job, just for $30, $40, $20 to buy food. I don't see that desperation with the people from the villages. I've met my Kapanta. I said, Sabada, oh, said Chungo, whatever, oh, took my window. You know, it's very happy. So th this is one of the blessings that we have. Protect your resources in the, in the land. Don't worry too much about this COVID because in Fiji is probably the best place. You look at what's America now, the, the snow. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's tough. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yi Wa Singh. Eh? All uh, right, um, I will just hand over the mic to um, to this gentleman here from the uh, our trainer, because we are just waiting for another speaker from uh, for, from Furkai, because obviously if you want to do a business, you should learn about all the all the various laws and things like that eh, to be able to launch your product. Uh, the uh, representative from Furkai. Is about to come now. Uh, meanwhile, I'll just give this mic to uh, to Benyame whilst we wait eh, to carry on with our business plan uh, part. Uh, you can stand up, please, and just stretch your legs. I think we've had a wonderful presentation by Mr. Yi Wa Sing, <coughs> and I think Yi Wa Sing, uh, <coughs> like if you need some some assistance, you can actually 
come down to Garden City, is that right? Right, and, and see the wife who's actually running the business right now, eh? We came near by Mary Coir and Lamingo, my Toronto number, eh? Well, we take this little break. We'll just break for about uh, five minutes and then we'll come back here. Dice di vosotros, se que torna coffee ni cua, na que ela torna menos coffee ni mataca. Yeah. Only water is available. Ah, me te tramo no gutel. Can we have those, uh, that group that volunteered yesterday, please? Come on, all group members come up here, please. Brother, come down here. Come on, come down here. Come on, let's have your support, please, come.
Okay, as you've been notified yesterday, there were two groups that uh, volunteered to present their business plan. Okay, we have one up here. Um, let's give a clap for this group. And maybe after presentation, you can ask questions. Okay? Maybe you can comment. Okay? We are all learning. Okay? To you. Over to you. Facebook. Ngona lumi etei. Kepka na soi etei lebu ibine ngo kila kima mi etei lumi. Iyo na kima mi se etei lumi ngo na 1982 se etei kina na lumi ngo. Iyo elebu ngo na na vikayado esenge ni mai i avalati kina na lumi. Vaka kima mi etei lumi nga voli tagiti ko na 50 cents a kg. Dakila na etei lumi kima mi zu lako sa chingai waie. Kimami tete na wai, kimami tui wai like three to four hours. Kim nangai zambe mai, mai singani tu nene mami lumi. Ya ke singani chukna lumi mai wai, ni kimami lako mai vanua, mai lako mai na zangilamba, kimami sa sindro ni lakova. Mbata kwa te sartu eni waiti tombu. Na zangilamba sa nakautanga na lumi, kena kena vata, sa lako vata wai. Sa lusi sartu ngai kiana ni mami zaka zaka. Ia itu nak kaki tu sange tak kawang gua, kita mampu kalung ngata kena. Ngono gua ngai itu nak satu zuru mana tak beneficiaries, satu ngai lay i kau taya ni itu nak itu nak turanga, melayu bos api kita mami membalai tanah value wedding ni lumi. Kita mami lebi tanah marama kita tak kawa, ia kalung ngata balai bunyu bunyu ia londi nama meu meu sah tak kawa nama bisnis gua. Saya ramai ni lutut kita nama rama, nampi sini sungguh sangat kita kawan dua dua tak kemau yau. Ia keng orang go, ni nabiya tu kuna, na na tak kemau ni nampi sini sungguh, itu bucinga na value wedding, na value wedding orang sahaja kawan bucinga, esyang ni nunggu, ni nunggu kila esyang orang orang nunggu kerir nama rama, mungkin mami tak kawan bata, mungkin mami laku pada YouTube, mungkin mami terus tak kena sana kah, mungkin mami tak kawan. Ia pun ada beberapa yang mereka kena balik untuk na Ministry of Fisheries, atau orang yang bukan yang uti kau nak kena tumbuh cikin orang ngu business. Ngonango sa operation ngu i lot eight wangga tambu street batu wangga, sehingga so ni sedih di mana ka, atau tiga buti ngangu ana tolu na undolu, kau nai lab sa rawat mai bana ngu business i. Na buni ngu rawat na ilabongo, balai tani na buat kah ni mabuk anga sangai tu kau nyuting ngu. Elevo na wakang gua support tak kau cikgu mana nunggu bisnis. Ia tu cikgu mai balang ye. Ia apa bini mana kan elevo nang on on do kerir tu. Mian kan kat guna mersam so ni omona so malu stale. Aku sejak kau cikgu ay, aku sendi nau tiku ay. Aku sadi di cikgu nang bisnis ingo. Nang on nang go nang bisnis ko dah kau cikgu ay. Sadi wan nunggu products. Ia kita boleh dengan apa ye tu luna product. Ia na oil, na na lotion bata ke na na seaweed juice kito wablid ki na yon na kena boya sa hanggay kito zakabangan sa value wedding wana menta zakabutiko meron itumbo ki na nonda business eh yon right now sa adidi chiko na lumi Fiji sa toso chiko kaya baka nanggay so na kena bakta taro au nanggay kerea muni nanggay bitar taro may biyaw sinya 
Edda ya ni wana Facebook account ya na Lumi Fiji. Ya unga na kena kau chukina. But kiri na member sa think sa about 380 members kim sa chukina ngo. Kepaka na wana na peka kata ka na Lumi. Na Lumi ngo ya pangitagi chuko na nitu ka wana health and beauty. Oko ya pangitagi sa chunga menda za kavane ngo anta na marama, na matanda. Kwa sabata na matanda. Do talangana ka na mati ni suka. Kaya baka ni nanggay lako nanggu page. Ni nanggay reza kina. Iti ko kina ndo na ro na turanga. Ito bro na mati ni suka. Na turanga ngo na eva na sa... Sa... Zambaka na gana. Sa angara sa artunga. Aunggali tukuna bikwa ya na lumi erao ni u... Sulia biki mo ni mo ni tawo le amanda. Mbata kwa na professor babu li dhubiki tau tukuna kwa ya kwa ya... E wai ni mati ni mati ni suka. Wai ni mati talanga ni kidney problem. Kepa kandu bi kenda ya chiku bi kwa na kidney, okwa ra ni waluto kana stow no kwa chiku bi kwa na kidney. Ya na pa mazala da kabi kito, au sama ni kabi kwa na pato bale mande bi kemu ni. Ye tu ranga ni tele bo sama ni elra ranga kwa mo pato bale bo. Rua na, au baka to bale anga baka rua bi kwa ya. Na ya pa na sama ma da senga tal ni lako bali mbula. Ustia, satu sucuk nam bisnis ngo, salak serai naturang prime min sa usah mani tukun serbi ko ya. Ebi dana ngo ni cukun alam mani korong ko, ngontal no session. Aku batu belebi, tu bi rucuk nan dreami. Ertu salis sume na tu mi, esang ni rawat na tu mi. Aku sah mani tukun bi turang prime min sa usah mani batu belebi tu na lumi. E rawat serangan na bi kaket tu yang under tu. Ya, kebukan ini nak aku nunggu page cik tengah kita nak kenderi tambah nongon ya. Aku setambah kata tengah, mana bandi nanti tak tengah ni ni sayang hati aku nak lumi, ni kau yang ana eh apa eh eh yang hati aku nak nak lumi kuat ye. Siang ni kan ni kanga ni uku kan ni beauty, kata langa ni wani mati health wise. Kerana saya bukan orang yang tinggal di tempat ini, saya bukan orang yang tinggal di tempat ini. 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 Saya bukan orang yang tinggal di Yo keba kawir nam tola kani ni si bobira, aw na pato bole amanda ngay ang onra. Bole tani kani way tu yo sa ng suci ni endu endu itu na ng oni na ng onto kenta. So ay allergic ka so ay lakbab na kabira. Yo dati ko na bole ngoy yo sa na surit kimi sa na keba kani na so. Ebi na katangan rea bati ko na bibu kaya nungo business na tubo ka raw meno bukay kenta. Yeah. Oh. Kita lawan orang ramai tentang kalungan orang na tiga puluh orang na kenilaf merau nangai pokrita kembali kaya ni. Nak 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 tahu? I think I've got your your plan. Don't don't worry about that. But just carry on with that, because we have other speakers as well waiting. Isa kira-kira ngaji pekolah mau memuji positif kengko, mau mui tok ngai liung ko, berarti mereka luar ni mungkin ada live stream. We have a live stream coverage for all around the twelve campuses in the region, eh? So we are televising this to all the region, all right? So if you stand here, you won't be seen by people in Samoa and Tonga and all around the region, eh? Right? So if you can stand at the front because the camera is shooting directly at you, eh? Thank you. I think uh, most of us uh, here, most of us here were asking about just to simplify some terms, eh? Yesterday, and I also have comments for that. So that's why I've uh, try and uh, make an effort to just change the slides we have in front of us. 
So we have terminology. Terminology means the Nabi Bosaki de Bangatak in Wafika, here in Donifika. Na resource, na assets, any resource owned or controlled by business. Okay? Any resource owned or controlled by businesses. Say, na yao, ito kaya na yao na business. Okay? Na yao, kila, na kila, live, na ilabo, na motoka, na ndesi, na tali, wardrobe, all those are assets. A root you can was was. Okay, there are two types. One is current assets. Okay. They are sold and used in the business operation. They are now. A bag and a tag and a can of the business. You know, but it's like a little bit of a Accounts receivable. What kind of was what Britannia? Okay, I love what Zingoma. Don't be a nice sound. So, so me being in the now. Okay, don't be a nice love Zingoma. Okay, non current assets a business long term investments value not realized within within an accounting year. And I know you in business at two in the day, Rao Talani, Rao Lamai. And I can't have a tag in Becca, send a can high tag in Becca, eh? Mira will love to go mine, eh? I'm going to do a son of a bag of a machine, send a son of a tool lily, the son of a generator, it'll be got a lesson. Come on, Tata. Where is the button? Not working. Moving on. Liabilities. Na ilavonga e dinautaki. E don ka on dinautak. E chikun pa kita leso na imbalin balin ni liabilities. E yao engo e ntabuli sa chikun na e kawafika na bosta. And non da vital no Africa, and I love and di no taki. Okay. Current liabilities. E chiko ndo talo kaya na ndo na current liability, short term financial obligations due in one year. I love me kaya saw mi ver na vero tauria ay makinay. Ano na mga papers mga peritanya na accounts payable. Okay. One was so mikina. Equity, Wafika, and a share on beauty and alumni business. So then, like, and I was supposed to be supposed to be no more commitment. No one was fully given in a share. Once you give in a share, that's your commitment in the business. Okay? Yes? But now, so then, don't say I'm most vehicle. Betul tak? It's your sweat. Kena balik balik siapa? Ye, berar sen kilat siapa nak balik balik siapa? Anak yang balik balik. What is operation? As in mathematics, profit and loss. Ye, in profit and loss. So those are the three uh, statements that we are looking at yesterday. Okay? First, we'll uh, look at profit and loss. Okay? There are only two things that you look at. It's the income and the expenses. Money coming in, money going out. That's when you subtract expenses from income. Income, okay, minus or less expenses, okay. Cash flow shows the flow of cash in and out of the 
business. I did uh, uh, schedule a, a short uh, story on what? House and a water tank. Yeah? Yes or no? Yes. House and a water tank. Okay? Once you use the water, you have to refill the water. Okay? How about if you give a lot of dinau if you're owning a, a canteen? Mother. <laughs> okay? So don't give a lot of dinau. Or even don't give any dinau. No dinau. Okay? That's when, you, when your business is, will, uh, when your cash flow will be affected. Okay? And sometimes uh, there's always a joke when we come to the uh, villages with a uh, small canteen. You come uh, once, you see the, the inside of the shop, which is full of stock, full of goods. And after three months, what do you see? Almost half of the room is empty. Yeah? So there's always a problem. Eh? So you can say that their cash flow is affected. Okay? Balance sheet is when you, your total asset is subtracted from your total liabilities, which will give you net assets. Okay? There are two things that uh, uh, will happen, okay? uh, or will be um, portrayed in this, uh, in this uh, balance sheet, is that will show your net assets and also your total equity. Okay? As I've said, now you know what is asset, okay? And you know what is liabilities, okay? It'll be sold in details in the, the, the cash flow and the profit and loss statement and balance sheet statement that I will uh, discuss later on. Also in the balance sheet, we have uh, capital or share or contribution, okay? Plus profit will give you, will give you equity. What's an equity? Yeah, share plus profit. Share plus profit. Okay? Okay, let's move on. Any question before we move on to the next slide? What's What's income, what's sales, and what's revenue? All mean the same thing. Okay? Okay, we'll move on to that same... Uh, now I've got all the, the information that was missing yesterday. <laughs> so I must apologize. <laughs> okay? Let's continue from uh, where we left. Yeah, we have uh, flower sales, 180,000. 180, That's for one whole year. Okay? And we have administration costs, 6,400. Rent for the shop is 28,000. Cash flow wages, which is uh, 6,000. Interest on loan is 11,000. Electricity and gas, 4,000. Display case which is an asset, 16,000, cash at bank, 24,600, shop fittings, 25,000, cash on hand, 8,000, accounts payable, 4,600, her share was 25,000. So that was a contribution, okay?
Okay, then, now let's jump on to the Excel. Eh? Let's hope this will help. Now, so on the, the spreadsheet, we have uh, the cash flow. Cash flow is a statement that shows money coming in and going out. Okay? Wabichi, waraitaka, nelaboe, surmai, kenelabo, wakang taka. Okay? As simple as that. For the people who are coming from the community, just understand that. But we have more in depth learning on this okay i don't have to teach you about uh, the accounting equation because it will become too complicated for you okay just have to understand this and maybe you can uh, receive those in-depth uh, learning or training uh, from us okay from the cooperative college if you want to now, for any cash flow, we'll always have an, an opening balance. Okay? So, where will you keep that money? In the bank. Remember, when you're operating a business, don't keep any cash in the pocket or at home. Okay? But it's, <laughs> I mean, th that's uh, the purpose of safekeeping, eh? Safekeeping of your your asset, and also uh, because you cannot escape this, and uh, it's a uh, an obligation. It's yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, good. Especially if you are small, eh? Small micro enterprise business, eh? Okay. So, what does that? What does that um, um, tell us? If you are producing less, it will hurt. Yes. So you have to produce more, okay? Do mass production, okay? You will not feel the hurt of anything. That's a Chinese philosophy. They produce, uh, they do mass production. You've seen their goods. They produce in the mass and then what? They sell cheap, yes? Yeah. You've seen their products, yes, sold in all, in everywhere, in every shops, yeah? 
And uh, you, our children, they get tempted because they are so colorful. Okay? So, please, as Mr. Washin uh, just alluded, uh, you plow the land, you do mass production. Okay? If, it's, uh, if you have to plant one million dollar, do that. There's no one stopping you. Okay? And you won't feel the hurt. And now let's talk about uh, uh, um, grog planting in our village, okay, cover planting, cover farming. And um, they, they always say that uh, there are a few plants have been stolen and it hurts them. And I'll tell them that because you are planting less. Okay? You have to plant some for the fifth. <laughs> <Yeah? laughs> plant some for the thieves. Yeah? <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, challenging you. Okay? That's one end of it. Okay? And that's the other end we are talking about from the uh, yeah, taxation part. Yeah, but uh, the more uh, the clarity, clarity of the taxation part um, will be shared by the FERC uh, offices who will be coming next. So you can ask a lot of questions from them. Okay, let's move on. Cash coming in, Naila Wadurumai, January. We have flowers, sales, and uh, we have maybe some uh, donations. And you, there you have your total cash income. And uh, on to the cash outgoing, Ilavo, Ebagangataki. Now you have a whole lot of uh, expenses there. How about you take it? Administrative, can I be a business? Okay. Na counting fees, na saw ni kena di kaya na tutu pa ilabo, na shop rental, rent ni store, advertising and marketing, kena buo na utaki sa kaya ni boli, ando wrong da men uh, all the time in the in the TV. Have you heard about those advertisements? Okay, they pay for that. RB and RC Manu buy with the advertisement, they pay for those advertisements, okay? And also in newspapers. We have uh, bank uh, fees and charges. You'll also have to pay for that. Bank fees and charges. Also have to pay interest paid. Naisauni. Ilabondi nautaka, okay? Interest paid. Utilities, that we kind of... Uh, things that we use often, okay? The needs, okay? Uh, like uh, electricity, water, gas, and so forth. We also have uh, telephone expenses, telephony. Just bear with me, those who are fast learners, please. Because I'm just uh, <laughs> trying to help those who come from the communities. Interest on uh, loan. Ilavo e musu en baleta na na ilavo di nautaki shop rentals rende ni store motor vehicle expenses maybe this for fuel and tires and so forth and repair and maintenance this is one of the most important expenses that any business should have okay yeah, if you don't have this, you'll suffocate. Yeah? Do, you want, do you know the meaning of suffocate? Yes. Okay, let's say you were uh, running a carrier business. Carrier. Okay. You incur all those expenses, tire and all, fuel and all. Okay. 
but you did not deduct maintenance cost. Okay. After three months of uh, operation running, what happened? There's a big langa. Okay. Halfway down uh, Nombowalu Road to Lambasa, you can reach Lambasa. Why? You have a big smoke coming out from your vehicle. Okay? And when the, the mechanics go and uh, assess it, okay, and they f find a big damage and um, calculated the project cost, cost about around about 10000 So you have to fork out that 10000 from your pocket. which you should have been deducting as an expense from the beginning. Okay? In any business, okay? Maybe it will be different from uh, uh, some businesses in different business nature, okay? Uh, with this, can you do maintenance for this? This product? My name is written there. <laughs> it was a gift from my cousin. So, can you do maintenance on this? Yes? What can you... Man, huh? Reweave it? Will, will the customers like that? No. Okay, I'll sell this too. Is it another? Eta, okay. Now it's demons. He already bought it. Yeah? And it's demons. Demons? She paid for it. She paid for it? <laughs> she paid for it demons. Okay. She already bought it. The business is yours. Okay. But she bought it already. Right. And it's demons. Can you... She had it. Can you do after service? Oh, no. No. <laughs> okay, that's the other point. Eh? Uh, for any business, you always do after service uh, business. Eh? Always do that. Once you sell a product, always follow that. Okay? Stationery and uh, printing, okay? uh, you must have a, maybe you'll have a, an office and all those stuff. Okay, so there's a cost incurred on that. And also for licensing. How many, t how many times do you pay your license? Only once, huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay, don't put all the charges from Jan to December. Okay. Insurance, for insurance, yes. People, those who are smart enough, they transfer their risk to the insurance company by paying the insurance company, uh, company premiums, okay, to cover their to cover their business, okay. Maybe in times of uh, natural disaster, theft, <laughs> and all those stuff. Superannuation. That's another fancy word for FNPF, okay. Um, Income tax, okay. okay, and I'll call them the devil. So, I won't pass you bingo. Is on Tamatazaka, okay, Keiko, okay, I thought of yesterday. Uh, maybe my thought they was asking. Okay. Where is the breakdown of that? Uh, are you paying yourself? Yes, of course. You pay your employees and yourself. And uh, how, how, if you run your business, how do you, how do you enjoy yourself? Where do you get the cost from? Where do you get those money from? <laughs> You're running your business full time. You want to smoke and drink and whatever, 
and feed your family. Where do you get those money from? <laughs> from your own salary. Good. That's why you pay yourself. Okay? So you have to give a name. You name it, eh? You have to give a name to, to all those expenses that is incurred. Okay? I'll pay myself, okay. This is my wages, this is my drink, this is my family's income. Da, da, da. That's why it's also important to have like two accounts. One personal account and one business account. That's why it's very important to have like two. Uh, if you're like running a business, you must have two accounts. One is a business account that handles everything that has to do with your business. And one is personal account. Whenever you get your salary from your business, it comes through your personal account. So this way you don't get them mixed up. Because most of the time we put all our money in just one basket. This way we, we have no idea of the cash flow. Because whatever we get from here, we use eh? like it's the same bowl. We pick from the same bowl. Instead of like having two different bowls to like cater for different, for the two different, which is personal and business. But the level one can then I take a can do okay about the thing. And just to clarify what my friend asked over there, in, most of us, we are always scared of income tax. We shouldn't be. Because the only way our government runs is through tax. To be able to have like a health care system or like, any, like education, you need tax. Our government survives on tax. And it's on us. Like every individual in here, we contribute to having a good government. But it's uh, the policy making everything, we leave it to those we choose. That's why we have elections. And also like for income tax, you will not be paying income tax like if you earn less than, uh, if your profit is less than 16,000. I just made the research. We did a business consultation uh, seminar, uh, workshop with ANZ just last Saturday. And we learned about that. Yeah, we don't have to be afraid of income tax. If your profit is more than 16,000, then you pay tax. Profit means like, then you pay a little bit of tax from them. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, we will be having the people from the, from the tax department, they, they, they will be here uh, soon after this presentation, okay? Uh, we will be having the people from, uh, from the capital gains, uh, the CGT department, you know, if you, if you actually have a business which has shareholders, yeah, they're buying uh, how many percentage of, uh, of shares within the organization. We have, we've, we've got the representative of FERCA is going to come here. And then we've got the SME unit from FERCA as well. Eh? And I believe uh, for those of you who are doing businesses can actually uh, uh, lodge an application through them. If your income is 500,000 or less, you are tax exempted. All right, so you won't be able to pay tax unless you file an application with the SME unit for FERCA eh, if your income is less than 500,000 a year. Right? So you don't get to pay tax. Only if it's over 500,000 a year, then you get to pay tax. But you've got to f you know, uh, register with that, uh, that particular unit. Eh? So those FERCA people are going to be here straight after this, uh, this presentation, right, to, uh, to enable us to, to ask a lot of things about the, the fright of actually paying money to the government. Eh? Thank you. I think we'll uh, stop here because the minister is just uh, at the door. <laughs> My minister. <laughs> Maybe you can just uh, talk amongst yourself about what you just uh, learned, okay? And then we'll continue later. Okay? Um, it's coming.
Let's continue. Can I want you to help me? Okay? Unjumble this. Unjumble this for me. Okay? Now this uh, guy here, Mere, has helped help us to to simplify everything. Eh? Okay? There's a total for one year. 180,000. Okay, now we'll fill up this uh, fill up this uh, this <coughs> cash flow. 180,000 divided by 12. That's a total for one year. 180,000. You want to get per month. Huh? 15,000. Now let's drag that right across. We can then go to the coro. We can go to the coro. So that's it. 15,000 CNs every month. Okay? Any donation? Suppose. Hmm? Any donation? <laughs> Only for the first month. <laughs> you can get donation every month. Eh? Yes? Okay, let's. Let's have a number. Hmm? Hmm? 500? 1,000? Okay, 500. Okay, let's put 1,000. Right. <coughs> now, let's total that up. Our opening uh, balance, bank balance was 1,000. And for the first month, 15,000 she got from sales of flowers, grants, and gives her total as uh, 17,000. So 17,000 <coughs> was the total cash coming in. Okay? Total cash coming in. And how about, uh, let's go back to our case study. Uh, what's it? Administrative cost, is it? Uh, Divide by 12. I think I'll stop here. Right, we are so fortunate to have Mr. Fayaz Koya. Um, I think he's, uh, he's a well-known uh, uh, person here in Fiji, and, um, and we're so very lucky to have you here, sir. Um, Mr. Fazal Koya is the Minister uh, for the Ministry of Industry, Trade, and Tourism, and, and Commerce. Yeah? Right, uh, sir, just on behalf of the university, we'd like to welcome you today. Just give him a round of applause, please. All right. And um, I think we will um, we will just ask Benny just to stop his presentation. Probably give him uh, the mic now to, to to say something. Or all right, okay. So uh, so he'll wait while Benny finishes his presentation. All right. So uh, so it's really good to have a minister, you know, of our local government, of our of a Fiji government that's sitting here amongst us, eh? looking at the big crowd that uh, that we're having here at the ICT Theatre. All right, Benny. Okay, let's move on. Hmm. 
Okay, on to our case study. Where is our administrative cost? Okay, calculate that. 6,400 divided by? 12. Five? 533.33. Okay, let's drag that across. What's our next? Uh, Rent. Rent for shop? It's missing. Where is it? 27? Rent for shop? Twenty. Two triple three point three three. Good. It seems answers are coming from this end. How about from the other end? <laughs> okay, what's our next? Uh, back to our case study. Casual wages. Where is the casual wages? Number? Can't see properly. Number? 35. Okay. 500 per month. Right. Shout it out. Come on. Right. What's our next cost? Interest on loan. How much is that? Nine six six point six six. All right. Oh, my goodness. Our next expenses. All right. For three three, right? Next. <coughs> Display assets. I told you to unsemble it. That's not part of the expenses. Uh, hmm? So fittings is not part of the expense. Unsemble it. Yes, the only one? Come on, what did I, what did we learn from uh, balance sheet? Come on. Cash payable, all those will come under balance sheet, okay? Okay, now let's calculate our, our cash flow. Total outgoing, uh, Drag it down. Now for us in the village, we don't have this, eh? But we are fortunate enough to... <laughs> All right, total outgoing. Is that? Is that right? No. Heading or oh, sorry. Shed one. Right. That's right? Right. Let's move on. Now. Set up? Right. Now let's manage. I don't know how to operate this technically. Manual, okay. Good. Some good mathematician here. Seventeen thousand minus four thousand six. Four thousand six. What's your answer? Twelve three three. 
0.35. Right? <clears throat> now I'll just show you the first one, the first month, okay? The same total will be our our beginning for the following month. How much is that? Come on. 3.35. Okay? Now that's how it goes. Okay? From here, take the total. There will be an opening balance for the following month. And then, once again, okay, carry up the total to the next month. And that's how it goes. That's cash flow. I think we'll stop there and hand it over to our minister. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, everybody. A special bullet to my friend Joe, my golfing buddy from many years ago. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to see you all here in, in such big numbers. And um, I'm very happy to be here today. And uh, this is a very um, important thing, not just for you all, it's also important for government that you're actually going through this process. And I want to say thank you to, to USB for, for organizing all of this and really appreciative of... of understanding uh, what entrepreneurship means you know it is a critical component with respect to what what government does but I, I, I want to start off by telling you something uh, something funny but it's a true story you're all here because uh, you're all wonderful Fijians and uh, you're all very creative and I, I want to I want to make you understand about how creative we are as a people. And it's a funny story, but it tells you exactly how creative we are. And in many facets of life, we're very creative. One of my uh, boys who looks after me came back from Liv Anybody from Libuka? Huh? Oh, there you go. See, this is how creative the people from Libuka are. Um, during when, uh, at the height of when, when the COVID pandemic actually started, uh, as you would all remember, we had curfews on, and one curfew was from, uh, I think it was 9 till 5 a.m. or something like that, the first ones. So uh, a gentleman uh, from Levuka was walking, I know, you all know Levuka has one road past the, <laughs> past the fisheries and goes up towards the villages. And he was walking towards one of the villages, and a, and a policeman uh, actually saw him walking. It was beyond the, the 10 o'clock, sorry, beyond 10 o'clock already, and he was actually walking just before the a bridge. So the policeman <coughs> saw him past 10 o'clock and, and stopped him and said, you know, in our usual way, he said, Oi, <laughs> what are you doing? And he stopped and he stood at attention. And uh, he said, what are you doing? You know, it's beyond 10 o'clock. You're supposed to be at home. There's a curfew on. Did you not know that? So the gentleman turned around and said, sir, I do. That's why I'm waiting for 5 o'clock before I can move. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. I'm not kidding. The policeman told us. And there's another part to that story. <laughs> Only in Lebuka. <laughs> so, so the next day... I think it was next day or the day after. And if you don't believe me, you can ask one of my boys who actually told me from Lebuka, he's here. And then a couple of days after, I think he, same gentleman, same policeman in the car, at the same time, past the curfew hour. This time he was actually on the bridge. So the policeman said to him, after swearing at him, he said to him, you again? In, and the guy turned around and, and saw the same policeman and immediately dived into the <laughs> river. So the policeman ran up after him towards the bridge and said to him, come out of the thing right now. We're going to arrest you. He said, no, you come here. <laughs> 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 
and it was cold. Do you think the policeman went in there? No, he didn't. <laughs> but, but it's a great example, ladies and gentlemen, of, of how creative we are. You see how creative he was. He said, I'm going to wait here till 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm not moving. And when the policeman came the second day, he dived into the water because he knew it was cold and the policeman wouldn't come. But that's how creative we are. And, and you know, being an entrepreneur means, literally means it, and how creative you can be. You don't necessarily have to start in a big way. You don't necessarily have to start in a small way. You know, you start in your way. You really start in your way. There are many things that, uh, that I want to talk about. So let me officially start to the representatives of, of uh, and it's from senior management of the University of South Pacific. Uh, there are some invited guests, I also understand. Um, students, entrepreneurs, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you from Levuka. <laughs> Bulovnaka, and a very, very good afternoon to all of you. It, it's actually a, a, a wonderful pleasure for me to be here today. And I understand that uh, there have been some other speakers throughout the week who have been uh, talking to you along the same lines. I'm encouraged and I'm, I'm actually hopeful to see all of you, uh, hopeful also about seeing all of you here today among our entrepreneurs and, and, and aspiring entrepreneurs. You may not realize, ladies and gentlemen, but you actually have the power to change the dynamics of our entrepreneurial sector, given the actual evolution of, of uh, technological advancements and, and the new norm which we have to adopt to. And the new norm has actually come about because of COVID-19. Over the past, uh, um, past few years, the government has actually invested about $90 million in uh, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises through our various targeted uh, programs as the MSMEs to us, to government, and to everybody, we should realize it's actually the engine for growth for our economy. I want to take this opportunity also to commend USP for hosting this entrepreneurial fair uh, with the theme, Change Your World and Become an Entrepreneur. You know, and it's, it's, it's very timely, and I think it's wonderful to see so many of you here. And it's also timely as the Fijian government is actually striving to uh, encourage our citizens to become, and I've said this time and time again, to become job creators rather than job seekers. And uh, not everyone will become a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a politician or a government minister at the end of the day. But there is nothing stopping you from starting your own business. This pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, has actually taught us uh, that we, we can't rely on the tourism sector alone. And we must diversify our economic base. How many of you here have been part of the tourism sector? I see a few people here who have been part of the tourism sector and now, you, you, you know, you, taken up this opportunity. We actually have to diversify our economic base. We must actually ad uh, adapt to the new, the new normal. And entrepreneurship literally actually means doing business. And a, it, it, it is a critical component. And you must all realize this. It's actually a critical component of our, our, uh, our growth and our job creation. The government actually has a number of programs uh, to help you become uh, self-sufficient entrepreneurs. Many of these programs are actually run through our ministry, Ministry of Commerce, Trade, Tourism and, and Transport. Uh, in addition to this, we also provide uh, business advisory services and business savvy training. And we've also opened up a dedicated MSME helpline and I'm not sure if you all have this number, but it's 9986014. Uh, and this is to, so that we can become more accessible uh, to our MSMEs. To improve business acumen and accelerate growth and to create jobs and to tap into new markets, the ministry through the MSME Fiji uh, also 
uh, and, and through cooperative teams. We actually offer business training and through these trainings in the past uh, year we have helped about 2,000 businesses in understanding their costs uh, and their pricing and business planning and forecasts and post-disaster recovery. Some of you may have been part of it, but you must take up this opportunity because the government values what you do. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, our, our programs are, are, are not uh, incomplete and these actually start with training, with funding, and then there's a continued hand-holding exercise uh, through the trainings and where possible we do some mentoring. And this actually gives Fijians a holistic uh, understanding in, in how to do business and to ensure that you are able to, uh, to, to partake in executive strategies and to further grow your business successfully. It's a positive and a rem remarkable achievement, ladies and gentlemen, as the Ministry endeavours to, to continue providing as many businesses a savvy training as possible. And in fact, the minist Ministry's training offices are conducting a five-day business uh, training right now in the Western Division. And this will be followed by our, our training in the Northern Division next week. And we're providing these practical training to, to, to strengthen the understanding of MSME business model to build healthy business habits and, of course, to, to instill good governance mechanisms. Uh, and more often than usual, the uh, uh, impacts of these trainings are not realized immediately, but the, but the impact remains. And I encourage you all, ladies and gentlemen, to sign up for these business trainings because you can never stop learning. You, just, you can never stop learning. My team from the ministry are here, so please reach out to them and to sign up. And when I say to you, you can never stop learning. I'm still learning today. I may be the minister, but I actually still learn from my own staff on a daily basis about things that are different, things that are new. They're younger than me. Of course, they're going to come up with new things. So we should always have an open mind. You must always remember that you can always learn on a daily basis. One thing for sure, ladies and gentlemen, amidst the pandemic, one thing is for sure, it's, it's our youth who will face the impacts in the near future. And what this means is that they need to be at the forefront and leading the charge in terms of recovery. And that is something that the Fijian government is acutely aware of. And uh, one, of your, one of the youth-centric programs led by, by the ministry is the Young Entrepreneurship Scheme, which uh, some of you know about. It's called the YES Scheme. The YES program actually targets uh, the development of young Fijians and like most of you here today who have innovative business ideas and, and, but find it difficult to secure some seed funding from financial institutions. And we want to encourage the youth to identify um, gaps in the market and come up with unique solutions, whether you're actually creating a product or whether you're creating a, a service or even a new process. We are here to ensure that your ideas can evolve into bankable projects. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of the YES program is largely attributed to what we term as a public-private partnership approach. Our YES selection panel is made up of 12 private sector members from a cross-section of background. So it's not just somebody from government, it's actually the private sector also. We have bankers, we have business people, we have academics, all so that uh, all so that we can actually provide some guidance, the best guidance uh, to uh, and mentorship to our youth. Last month, ladies and gentlemen, I, I joined a young man, uh, a, an aspiring young entrepreneur. His na name was Mr. Rakin Wahid, who was one of the Yes recipients. In a span of just a few months, Mr. Wahid actually he actually launched a new app. Uh, and uh, now, what's so special here is that through this particular app he has essentially contributed to two priority areas of the Fijian government. That is to transform Fiji into a modern hub uh, for health and medical care and provide solutions for Fijians to actually adapt to the digital age. And more than ever before, ladies and gentlemen, the government is actually ensuring that our, our, our MS, MSMEs, which will be all of you when you come up with your new businesses, uh, are ready for business when we actually open our borders. We are working to, to create an enabling environment where MSMEs are, um, 
uh, and the wider business community can actually thrive. In fact, the Fijian government continues to simplify business procedures and, and, and other essential reforms, especially for MSMEs. So in order to, to start business uh, with two simple steps, you only need two simple steps. Registering the business name with the registrar of companies and uh, registering the business tax identification number with Fiji Near Revenue and Customs uh, Services. With these two simple registrations, ladies and gentlemen, uh, business entrepreneurs can actually start operating their business and you'll have six months to apply uh, for the statutory requirements. However, those, those doing something in a high risk category, businesses are required to apply for statutory requirements before they open their uh, businesses. In a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Fijian government actually strives to encourage inclusive and, and sustainable uh, development of MSMEs and for youth. Um, the growth of MSMEs is, is not only essential to job creation, but it's essential to income generation. Uh, and in rural development and poverty alleviation, and most importantly, the empowerment of youth and our women. And I see there's a majority of women here today, and it's wonderful to see all of, all of you. And ladies and gentlemen, as I'm uh, sure you're all aware, um, budget submissions are also now open, so put on your creative caps, and, and I encourage all of you to make contributions, you know, be, whether it's small or big, make your contributions. You never know what you may come up with. It's not all about just us. So the submission time is actually here for us to, to listen. We want to hear from you because your voice matters. And we want to create an environment where youth are actually part of that particular decision making. When I say youth, I see another friend of mine, a uh, very elderly gentleman, Humphrey Bolubnaka. How are you, sir? <laughs> He's put his pen down. That's about as youth as you can get. But uh, with those few words, I, I hope I've encouraged you all. Um, you know, one of the most important things for us and, and for all of you to remember is SMEs are the engine for growth of any country. The economy needs to grow and, and all of you please ensure that you take as much as you can out of here to, and to help you and always remember that the uh, ministry is always uh, on standby for any assistance that you actually need. Uh, even just to have a chat to our people at the university. We, are wel we welcome you, welcome you at the ministry, ministry to come and ask any question in, that is that you actually have. And once again, thank you very much uh, for the lovely welcome. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, um, so long as it's not about politics. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nak. Any questions? Any questions, please, uh, uh, Suli? Assalamu alaikum, uh, Mr. Well, Sab. Welcome, Salam. <laughs> I'm Sulia Sitamani Lebu from Nemesimasi in Telebu. Um, these are stats from uh, <coughs> Bureau of State Survey. <coughs> 2013 to 2018, 2% 2 of the, the business or the economy was in native hand, natives' hands. Eh? <coughs> uh, that would mean, uh, colleagues, <coughs> that 98% was in the hands of uh, non-natives. Eh? <coughs> I'm bringing this out to encourage us, natives, to get into business. <coughs> From March 2019, it dropped 1%. <coughs> I was listening to the radio when this was announced. Eh? <coughs> um, as of last year, sir, one, two or three of us were trying our best in order to encourage us, the indigenous people to get into business. We were planning for <coughs> an in indigenous uh, business expo, whereby uh, the indigenous can come together to come and uh, showcase what they have been doing. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, to encourage one another, to support one another. Eh? 
I'm glad to see the initiatives by government in encouraging everybody in Fiji to, to get into business, uh, especially in this uh, <coughs> COVID uh, time span that we are, uh, that we are going through. <coughs> uh, we are glad that you're encouraging us uh, to try our best not to be employees only, but try to be employees as well. Eh? <coughs> Uh, we all must uh, strive to do that. <coughs> uh, to listeners, please, when you go back home, try to find out in the net about this person here, Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki. <coughs> uh, and the book that he had written was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It encourages us to get, to get into business. <coughs> uh, the little request, sir, Maybe later, not this year, because we know about the financial constraints that uh, this pandemic had, has brought upon the government. We might uh, be coming to you to request for these uh, indigenous uh, business expo uh, for funding. <coughs> and uh, to you, my brothers and sisters who are listening, we can also, we'll pay a little fee to come and show us what you are doing. <coughs> It can also be a means of encouraging others uh, to follow you and also to make uh, improvements uh, on, uh, on what they are doing. <coughs> I think that is all that I'd like to share now, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, please remember, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and please remember Everybody in Fiji is equal. Nobody gets treated any differently. There are uh, the opportunity that exists that I've just talked about and many others that I've talked about is open and equal to everyone. So you are, it, it, there's no discrimination, there's no choosing between this person or that person or you're from Talebu and I'm from Ra. It, right? I'm actually from the Ba province, but th th there's no difference. So feel free to approach the ministry at, at any time. And anyone, you can, you know, the, the opportunities that are available from from government's perspective are for everybody. If you feel like you need some extra incentive to incentivize, in terms of what you've actually said about the numbers. You know, it's it's and the other thing we must also realize that, that these opportunities that come become available, it's gentlemen like you that need to go to the particular centers to encourage more people to do it. We can do is a lot from on top. When we say that the opportunity is equal and it's available to everybody, you need to do the same. You need to do the same at at village level, at settlement level, wherever it is that you are to say these opportunities that are being made available by government are open to everybody. It's not just one particular section of the community. By, the, by virtue of the constitution, everybody is equal. Every opportunity is equal. Right? You have the right to economic participation. So just remember that everybody in this country has a right to economic participation. So thank you for that. Well, I think, look, if it, there is a specific ministry that deals with the Tokyo affairs, you know, there is a right channel and a procedure, approach them and, and find out. There is a specific ministry, it, it, it's looked after by the Honorable Prime Minister, who else do you want? You know, you get some guidance from there, they may enlist our help, etc., to get these things done, but I'm sure the ministry of Tokyo affairs actually goes out and does these things, etc. I know they do. Our teams actually go out at particular times for these uh, sessions with everybody. So don't feel like that you've been a community, a certain community is not allowed to participate or unable to participate. Everybody has a right to equal participation. Okay. Thank you very much. And Mr. Minister... Uh, Daga Humphrey. By the uh, way, ladies and gentlemen, that's Humphrey. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most experienced gentlemen in, in the country. Thank you. 
Mr. Minister, talking from the private sector, we, the private sector, we want to see more consultation. And you know yourself that I belong to another forum, which we always say that we should be consulted. But sometimes, somehow, people make rules or law without consulting. And sometimes, this kind of thing can also backfire. And it's not good. I would like to suggest, uh, Mr. Minister, that every ministry open up a suggestion box and provide email address so that everybody can write in and throw in whatever they want to say or do. I know you have talked about the coming budget. We are we are working, uh, you know, my group is working on it. But that's something that a lot of people do not know. And I'm afraid to say that government of all the, all the stakeholders do not expose their email address. Very few. Very few ministry expose their email address. Mine is K-O-Y-A-F-S at gmail.com. <laughs> Thank go, you. Go and look at the websites. There. They're all there, actually. We, the, please, Humphrey, uh, let's not get the wrong message out. Ladies and gentlemen, every government minister's phone number is publicized. 9908038 is mine. 9905100 is the PM's. It's publicized. And everybody's email is freely available. And apart from that, Humphrey, you know this better than anybody else. You can walk up to my office anytime. No. <laughs> it, sometimes it's easier said than done. <laughs> but Minister... <laughs> but Minister... By the way, ladies and gentlemen, Humphrey belongs to the Road Haulage Association. <laughs> but Minister, I think it's about time that maybe, the, maybe a publication should come in the press, uh, in the media somewhere that, you know, there's a suggestion scheme box being opened, invited, invited by uh, all the ministry. Because there are things that uh, people want to express, but can't be, can't be expressed without uh, uh, telling. And okay. the other thing, Mr. Minister, is that I, we like to see that the government also listen. Because there are many things that the private sector can do, know how to do, but someone has to listen. And if you don't listen, I'm afraid, you know, uh, nobody will contribute. Thank I'll you. I'll give Humphrey. you one example. Our neighbor country, Samoa. Samoa has an economical growth, I think, better than Fiji. But you know why? Perhaps not a lot of people know that the private sector contribute in Samoa and the government listens and the government uh, adopts, put into practice. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that the government listens and adopt the things that the private sector tells them because the private sector knows exactly where, they, where to go and where to make money and uh, improve things and, and grow the economy. So I would <laughs> like to suggest that maybe that some of this issue that I'm, I'm voicing here can be taken up. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Humphrey. Um, just for your information, I know at my ministry we have a suggestion box. As far as listening, I'm here. Aren't I? And I've just offered also, uh, with respect to budget submissions, that I, I did say in my speech, whether it's small or big, please make your submissions. That's listening. We, we do listen. We lo do listen and we do learn. And I appreciate your, your thoughts and your comments, Ampri. But uh, please, the, the, uh, have a look around it. I think most ministries actually do have suggestion boxes. And as I said, you know, the e uh, 
you can email us at any time. Uh, every email is read. It's not bypassed. So, but everybody's, uh, for everybody, this information is important. The phone numbers and emails of all the ministers, the permanent secretaries are freely available. If you just go onto a government website, um, and you'll find them there. Okay, and I, I appreciate your comments, Humphrey. Uh, Thank you very much. Minister, uh, one more thing I, I missed out. <laughs> And I, I want to uh, impress, uh, maybe that perseverance. Uh, <laughs> maybe that you can take it up. There are some ministry or statutory body that is not, if I might like to say, not doing his job properly. <laughs> Earlier in the day, I said that we have applied for a loan that has taken now almost nine months and not approved. And you know, somebody has to be set for that. <laughs> but tomorrow, tomorrow FDB will be here and I, you know, I think uh, they're going to hear something from me. <laughs> Maybe we should send them to Livuka to learn something, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, Humphrey. Anybody else? Come on, ladies. You're supposed to be the most creative. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, I would like just to go back where you explained about the MSME and you give us the requirements to do. Uh, this is coming from a home-based small business owner, and I would, like to, I would like you to elaborate more when you said high-risk um, business. So which, what kind of business are categorized into this? Um, I think it's fairly reasonably understood. Like say, for example, if you are uh, going to manufacture something that may be a health hazard, Etc., and then that's a high risk. It will require the health authorities or, or, or fire authorities, etc., to actually do something. So, those are the something like that. When I, when I say high risk, it is exactly what I say it is. You, as a natural person, you'll understand that okay, this is a risky environment that I'm going to be in. I'm producing, let's say, you decide to produce fertilizers, right? That are going to be not organic, but it's flammable or something, and it require it will require you to produce it in a particular environment. So you'll need to get extra. So just anything like that, okay? Enough. But you know, it doesn't mean you're out of the equation. It just means that you have to do that. Yeah. Sir. Just in regards to the YES program, eh? I'm one of the applicants uh, last year, the other year. I've applied two times, but uh, I was not granted. My question is, in terms of the unique, you saying that uh, your business proposal has to be unique. Eh? Firstly, I came up with a car wash business. I believe that uh, that wasn't granted because we have many car wash uh, around. So I came up with a one-stop shop. Everything was there, like at the center and everything in terms of business. Eh? Mm. Uh, but yet still, I was not granted. My question is, can you just liberate more on the uniqueness of uh, business in uh, terms of finance? You, you need to be innovative. You need to be trying to think outside the box. I mean, a car wash and a thing. And uh, if you said, okay, one-stop shop in, in terms of car wash, you can actually get your car fixed at the same time. All the it's something that's been done before. It's not like we had a huge amount of money to do it, because it requires innovation of some sort. Let's say, for example, um, I just granted a uh, certificate the other day to somebody who's making organic fertilizer. Right? He's actually he didn't apply for the Yes program, but on his own back, he's actually making organic fertilizer. So he's gone around and collected as much organic waste that's available from restaurants, etc., all that kind of stuff, and he's turned it into fertilizer. Turned it into fertilizer, and he's gone ahead and gone to Poetcom, gotten himself certified properly, and he has um, 
a four gallon thing and the larger ones also that he sells for how much is it, Mark? Twenty bucks? Eighteen dollars for one uh, container of organic fertilizer, which is certified, and he's just earned himself the Fijian organic branding, and he's actually certified by Poetcom. He went and also engaged with agriculture, so you can see what we mean, huh? Thinking, but he didn't apply for the yes grant. But it's those kinds of things that I'm actually talking about. You, you need to be innovative. You need to think outside the box. Those that are that are uh, into IT, those that are developing apps. You know, one of the things that you remember out of the out of the speech that I've actually said is, we as a government have uh, a need to encourage all of you to to think about diversification. We need to diversify and and stop being so reliant on on just the tourism sector to 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 give us the three billion dollars a year that we're actually earning out of tourism. We need to diversify. We have large tracts of land. We we need to get into agriculture. We need to organic, let's say for example, organic food fetches more money when you export it. We have many places around the world which why our ministry and biosecurity have gone and opened up pathways to actually to actually export to. Right? But it's not being used because our people are just reliant on okay just being a uh, um, normally employed somewhere rather than thinking outside the box and saying okay let me start with one acre and I'll start producing organic something I go to Poetcom come to us and we'll explain how it can be done just as an example so you need to be very innovative and creative like that gentleman from Levuka <laughs> okay you understand now I'm not sure if it's VAT. VAT's applicable to everybody. I'm, I'm uh, Faisal? VAT is applicable to all. You don't get exempted from VAT. But tax-free zone, Vanwalevu, and from Matawalu right through to Nasori. Yes? Am I correct, Faisal? Yes. Yeah? If you're setting up a factory of small sorts or whatever, if you're setting up a factory mm, selling uh, cassava chips or something in Etc. all those things. There are many, many uh, things like that that you can do in those zones. The reason why that was being done is so that we can actually get more businesses out in that area. And the last uh, question. Yes. Last year, we were told by six times that government stopped the publication of My Lama Kaiser and sent it to the Big Pumbo National Paper. I cannot reach the Prime Minister. We don't own Fiji Times. Yes, sir, but uh, they told us that the government stopped. We don't own, government doesn't own Fiji Times. But they, they told us that the government stopped. Yes, sir, but they told us that the Anybody else got anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Is your birthday today? <laughs> oh, <laughs> not available. I, I was born just last Sunday, so you and I are only a few days apart.
Naka. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't bring my wallet. <laughs> Look, I um I'm I I know you all appreciate this that uh at the moment uh the because of covid and you know we don't have tourism there's there's a lot of things that we have to keep a tight uh, tight grip on at the end, at the end of the day when when everything is back to normal there are many programs that we actually do there are lots of forms of assistance that we actually do my ministry alone we have the IHRDP we have the cooperatives we have the yes program we have the national export strategy we have a lot of programs where which we we actually do give uh, either equipment or money etc you know for people who export there were large sums of money that were given for exports etc and 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 some of you may go back home and become big exporters you know you just you all have a phone you're all on facebook you all know how to do the internet at the end of the day find out be creative think about it what can i export out of here that you know that the the 900 odd thousand tourists that have come here have a taste for what can i export out of here that people in fiji take for granted let me go and find out from the biosecurity or from the ministry where the pathway has been created for me to do something let me go and find out from agriculture where we can do it what is it that we can plant here and before you even go overseas you remember we had a tour we have a tourism industry we had a tourism industry that's worth 3 billion dollars to us that's a how many hotels that exist that you can supply to for something that you may think okay we can plant this here now or we can do this there's many opportunities that are available you know I, i can see you all thinking already what can we do approach them there are many things i mean i i i can tell you that we have like almost 60 different varieties of mangoes did you know that go to the government agriculture station and find out and you'll see we have so many different varieties of mango but you and i only know about four right that this as i say you just have to be innovative think hard and say how can i do business how can I be a little bit different and when you take these opportunities to fdb or bank it it, it actually works you cooperatives if you want to all get together and form a cooperative to do it cooperative doesn't mean that you're a bunch of poor people there are cooperatives that are actually worth a lot of money so there are many opportunities that are available and we want people to diversify and and start doing different things agriculture is actually also aware of that that diversification is a massively important thing for us for this country but thank you so i i appreciate what you actually said thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i i hope that helps you all as i said my number is 9908038 my email is koyafs@gmail.com i'm free thank you um if you wish to send us any inquiries my staff are here also please feel free to come up to the ministry if you if you have a a few minutes and want to chat with them i hope that was helpful thank you very much nobelu Um right um uh, could we just ask you just to stand up and stretch your legs please okay right um we have the people from the Fiji Revenue and Customs Authority I can see them peeping right through from there right and eager to come here and and share to us all the tax issues that people that people are inquiring about eh so just take a break now we'll call them in in about 2 uh, minutes time
Right, thank you very much. Uh, could you please uh, take your seat now as we haven't got much time and we really want to get the ball rolling. Yeah? As you can see, the FERCA staff are all here and uh, they represent actually three divisions. We have to see the capital gains tax. You know, I was talking to you about people who want to do like shareholding yeah, to form a, a, a probably a shareholding company. Right, and, and actually put in money for shares, right? So we have representatives from the, C, uh, the CGT section, and then we also have representatives from the SME section, right? Uh, the SME section is really the section where you actually learn how much money that you actually can make in one year, and then you begin to pay tax thereafter, all right? And then we have the, uh, the, the general uh, uh, FERCA rules and regulations that uh, you know that people who who are actually going into business should comply with, isn't it? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, just on behalf of the university, we'd like to welcome you all from uh, the Fiji Revenue and Customs Authority. Please, uh, you have uh, about 20 to 30 minutes. All right. So we'll just ask the crowd to give you a round of applause, please. Right. Um, take this. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Lindo Tengalala. I'll be I'll be talking about uh, capital gains tax or CGT, as uh, Mr. MC has mentioned earlier. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you and uh, into welcoming us, the team from FRCS, on behalf of the acting CEO. We'd like to extend our sincere gratitude for welcoming us into your session. Right, so when we talk about what is capital gains tax, it is basically a tax that is imposed on a person who has made a capital gain on disposal of a capital asset. When we say disposal, we mean selling or transferring of a capital asset. And it is charged at a rate of 10%. So when we assess a when we assess how CGT is payable, we follow a formula. So we have the capital gain. In, to, to get the capital gain, there's the consideration received. Consideration received, which is basically the selling price of the capital asset, reduced by the cost of capital asset. And the capital gain or the profit is subject to 10%. With the cost of capital asset, it's broken down into three categories. The first is acquisition cost, which is the buying price of the capital asset. Second is incidental cost. 
These are the costs related to the acquisition and the disposal of the property. And the third is improvement cost. Any expenditure incurred when you make structural improvement on the property. So a very good example is a, uh, a property which is uh, land and building. Someone is selling a residential property. So when this person sells, he sells it at a price what we call consideration received. And then the cost he can claim to reduce, to reduce the profit, the first is acquisition cost. Acquisition cost will be the buying price when he bought that particular property. I'm talking about a land and a building here. So incidental cost is cost related to the acquisition and disposal of a property. A very good example would be a uh, legal fees. When a person is in the process of selling a property, usually he would go through a lawyer who will, who will prepare documents and uh, who will act on their behalf. And the lawyer usually charges them, charges lawyer fee. So that could be an example of incidental cost. Another good example is real estate fees. When we talk about real estate people, they are the people who sell our property on our behalf. So at the end of the whole process, the commission that the, the, that the realtor charges, it can be considered to as an incidental cost, which is incorporated into the cost of capital asset. And the third one is improvement cost. That is uh, structural improvements on the property. An example is you buy a vacant land and then you construct a, uh, a house. So constructing that house is an improvement cost. So all those, all those three costs added together makes up the cost of capital asset. And then reduced from the consideration received gives you the capital gain and then 10% is charged on that gain. So when is CGT applicable? It, it is applicable when Fiji res residents dispose, dispose in capital asset at a gain, irrespective of whether the asset is located in Fiji or not, or non-resident disposing taxable Fiji assets. So when we mention what is a capital asset, according to the Income Tax Act, Section 2, there is a list that's there. From one to So we have a real property that's basically talking about houses, uh, land and building, and uh, also ships, yachts, and boats. And we also have shares, as uh, Mr. MC has uh, mentioned. Disposal or selling of shares is also subject to CGT. Interest in the capital asset, air, airplanes, and options, or other interest. So any, any other type of asset that, that is not included in this list, CGT is not applicable. So as you can see, a uh, motor vehicle is not a, is not a capital asset. So when someone sells a motor vehicle, CGT is not applicable on the gain. So for this, uh, this part here is what we call non-arms non length transaction. This is basically transactions between related parties. When we talk about related parties, we're talking about related in rela relation to blood relations, uh, transferring between uh, maybe your cousin, your brother, or someone you're related to, and also in relation to related companies. Where, whether a director of a company is selling or transferring property or shares to, to, its, uh, to his own company or between two companies who have the same shareholder. Those type of transaction is what we consider a non-arms length, what we consider a non-arms length transaction. 
So for CGT, we have some exemption provisions that, that uh, vendors can uh, qualify for uh, or they can apply for and then we grant them those exemptions. The first one is a resident individual making a capital gain below 30,000. But as you can see, we've put, uh, we've put thresholds that were effective in past years. Eh? So back in 2012, when CGT started, the threshold was uh, sitting at 20,000. And then after the December 2015 budget, the threshold moved down to 16,000. And then uh, after August, after 31st July 2020, on the 2020-2021 budget, the threshold increased right up to 30,000. So any capital gain made by a person or individual who is a resident person or a Fiji citizen that uh, making a capital gain below 30,000 is can be exempted. The second one is, uh, this is a, um, a popular exemption that almost for, that's available for Fiji residents and, uh, and uh, Fiji citizens. This is a uh, capital gain on first residential property or principal place of residence. Now this exemption is mostly applicable to the to selling of property. Eh? So if you are selling your first residential property or your principal place of residence, you are eligible for exemption. So if you are, uh, you are stay, currently staying on this particular property and then you decide to sell it, you can be exempted as well. So the, this, this section here talks about assets list, uh, sorry, or shares of, for companies who's listed on the South Pacific Stock Exchange. So if you are buying shares, I mean selling shares, if you are one of the shareholders for a company who's listed on the South Pacific Stock Exchange, the gain on sale on that uh, sale of uh, shares is exempted. And um, for this, uh, for the one in the middle is referring to exempt income. So mostly for this, what is applicable for this, uh, for this, for this exemption is uh, mostly referring to agricultural income. So if you have a farm, if you have a farm, you're currently working on it, you're currently cultivating, maybe it's a cassava patch or, or a sugarcane farm, and then down the line you want to sell it. So selling that uh, sugarcane farm is exempted under the Income Tax Act. The gain on sale on that sa on, of the farm is exempted under this section. This uh, section is section 87, we call it deferral. So these are the deferral rules that applies to CGT. It is, it is similar to exemption. Also, CGT is not applicable in this type of uh, disposal or this type of uh, transfer. So the first one, we have disposal between spouses. This is a divorce settlement the, the, in cases of divorce settlement. So in case uh, for dissolution of marriage, the, a couple decides to divorce and they have a matrimon uh, matrimonial property that they share. So when the court order comes in, this property has to go to the wife. So that transfer is a deferral rule under the Income Tax Act. So that transfers, that the CGT is not applicable in that transfer. This, um, sorry. The second one is uh, mostly referring to transmission, transmission by death in case the owner of the property passes away and then his uh, estate, the property is part of his estate, transferring from that estate to any beneficiary or to the trust executor or the trustee of that estate is, is a deferral rule that applies on income tax. So CGT is not applicable. 
And the first one here, it's talking about transfer between related parties. So as I've said, this is a non, for under non-arms length. Eh? So, but for this provision, it's basically limited to transferring to um, immediate family members. So you have to be transferring to your husband or to your wife or to your children, grandparents to grandchildren. But it does not extend to your cousin or your aunt, your, relate, your extended family, or even your in-laws, it does not extend to them. So it's only to your immediate family members. Th this uh, section is one of the main sections that, uh, that was amended in the 2020-2021 government budget. It's talking about uh, corporate reorganization. So just in simple form, in a simple form, this is uh, talking about transferring, or transfer transferring between companies, related companies. So if a company, so if this company A transfers to company B, in a form of corporate reorganization, it is also a deferral rule for income tax, and CGT does not apply. So for us at uh, Revenue and Customs, we have uh, we have some that some uh, conditions that needs to be met before the exemption applies. So one of the main conditions is that between the two companies, they have, they, they, have, they have to have the same ownership. So the shareholders and the directors have to be the same. So what happens when there is an assessment? When we talk about ass an assessment, when we give out a payable amount to the vendors for them to pay. So when, when you get a CGT clearance, you receive a CGT certificate. So you can't sell a property or you can't sell shares without the CGT certificate. So when we give out an assessment, there are two ways you can get the certificate. The first one is upfront payment. You pay the tax upfront, you get the certificate, or you or through the lawyer, you give uh, the lawyer's undertaking. The undertaking would tell us that after the sale, then the lawyers will come back and pay the CGT from the proceeds of the sale. So how will the CGT impact settlement? So without the CGT certificate, as I've said, you can't, you can't uh, make the sale. So at the Registrar of Titles, at CAF or MCEF and the Registrar of Companies, they will want the CGT certificate before you sell your shares or you or sell the property. So who files CGT? The CGT is filed by the registered owner and uh, they are liable to pay CGT when it's due. So, that is basically, in a nutshell, what CGT is all about. Thank you. Bulavinaka to you all. My name is uh, Chawana, and uh, I'm from the Customs uh, Department at FRCS, and I'll be just uh, briefly presenting on a few uh, incentives that we have in line with MSMEs. Just an overview and uh, introduction on the core function of uh, Customs and the F FRCS as a whole. Uh, mainly, FRCS, we uh, safeguard the country from potential outside threats and secure export imports, travelers with other countries all over the world. We also collect revenue for the government and work alongside with other border agencies, industries and the government for a secure and safe Fiji. Uh, just a simple brief uh, on that point. 
uh, we administer and ensure that the right amount of duty is uh, collected when importing uh, any good. Uh, also, uh, on duty rates and the customs tariff, uh, um, the customs uh, department, uh, we collect uh, duty and uh, the customs duty is uh, broken down into three parts and that is uh, consisting of the physical duty, import excise and VAT, and the calculation is based on cost, insurance, and freight. The customs tariff is a nomenclature that pr uh, provides the classification of all goods and its applicable duty rates. To view uh, any classification of any goods that you intend to import for your business, uh, we have the link below, or it, it's also in our website and uh, under the customs uh, tab where you can view uh, the customs tariff and also the duty rates. Some of the basic requirements for commercial importers. Um, so if you intend to import any goods, um, to clear goods for, from customs, the importer will need to present the joint ID. I believe you're all aware of the joint ID or the thin letter. Uh, also, uh, permits from other agencies. So uh, if you are importing uh, uh, specific goods that is of interest from a uh, department of environment like plastics, you will need to seek prior approval or obtain an import license from the department of environment before the good is imported into the country. And also for other border partners like uh, Ministry of Health or Biosecurity, uh, like food items, you really, uh, we need to obtain a license or permits from the ministry before the item is imported. Also, the commercial invoice that needs to be attached and the shipping arrival papers, such as the bill of lading, airway bill, of lading, airway bill or arrival advice. Um, duty concession, this is mainly... Uh, for cust uh, we have provisions uh, in the customs tariff, which is uh, the duty concessions uh, that is eligible for industries uh, that could fall under MSMEs uh, in which you import under duty free. And uh, we have specific codes uh, that is highlighted uh, for the different industries so we have uh, code 236 for manufacturing industries. Um, if you uh, own a company that is involved uh, in a manufacturing company, if you are involved in a manufacturing company, uh, uh, you, will, you are eligible for importing raw materials under code 236 and also machines. However, for the item to be approved under that concession code, uh, we have a team at uh, the Customs Department, which is a tariff and trade team, that will um, assess and uh, uh, inspect the manufacturing process in order for you to qualify under Code 236. Uh, code 231, uh, packaging for manufacturing. To qualify for this uh, code, you will need to be approved from code as a manufacturer from Code 236. You will need to be an, be an approved uh, manufacturer in order for you to qualify for packaging material under code 231. And also no, a note that, that is very important uh, for packaging material, uh, provided that the packaging item is not sourced locally. And then uh, we, if, if it's not uh, sourced locally and you're an approved manufacturer, then we can approve for code 231 on packaging materials. Um, code 232. Uh, for the fisheries and agriculture sector, we have concession under Code 232. Uh, just uh, an important note that if you are involved in fi any uh, fisheries and agriculture sector, you will need to uh, obtain a support letter from uh, the Ministry of Fisheries or the Ministry of Agriculture before you import any items under the two industries. 
And then we have code uh, 281 for aquaculture industry. We also have code uh, 247 for prawn farming and uh, code 248 pearl farming for any items that involves uh, the process on this uh, on prawn farming or pearl farming. Uh, code 255 for floriculture and also code 268 for bee farms. These are, these are just a few concession codes that we think that is in line with MSMEs. These are a lot more for individuals, but these are just a few uh, concession codes that uh, uh, we think that is, is, uh, a good, uh, is in line with MSME uh, for t today's uh, session. And how to apply for concession codes? For uh, concessions, uh, you will need to apply. Formal application will need to be lodged at the at the FR, with FRCS at, uh, for, uh, and it needs to be lodged with the tariff and trade section. There's a team that looks after processing of all these concessions. That is the tariff and trade team. And uh, the documents that needs to be attached is the invoice, um, business license and registrations, and the specifications of any items, and also the support letter that I've mentioned earlier for agriculture and fisheries incentives. Uh, contact person, so we have the contact person if you want to take note for any questions or any uh, inquiries on duty concession. We have the group uh, email that is highlighted on the slide for duty concession and uh, tariff classification if you're unsure of any duty rates and you're intending to import any items. We have the email for the HS valuation team and also for any other queries with the customs department on the, at, the, at any assessment level, we have uh, uh, the contact person, uh, which is also on the slide, Winaka. Uh, Bula, I'm Shaheen from uh, MSME, macro, I mean micro, small and medium enterprise. I'll mostly talk on tax incentives. Uh, my colleague, uh, Joanna, she had actually emphasized or had actually briefed us on custom incentives, which is important while you're importing, you're trying to import, you're trying to sort of uh, expand your business, you want to venture into new business and uh, or trying to import something. Okay, uh, very briefly, I'll just uh, exp um, go over the agenda. I'll just explain what is MSME, what is micro, small, and medium enterprise. How do we categorize these enterprise? And duties and tasks carried out by MSME. Um, what we actually do as a, this is a very new uh, incorporated uh, center at MSME. So we are trying to sort of uh, get to know all our small and medium enterprise population. Okay, benefits and incentives provided by MSME, I'll also emphasize on this. And current and future projects, I believe uh, most of you have benefited from these projects, MSME loan concessional, COVID-19. So we'll boost, uh, mostly po uh, talk on that too. Okay, so how do we classify MSME at FRCS according to tax law, right? It must be a small and micro enterprise under the Small and Micro Enterprise Development SME Act. That is the law governing this particular SME, SME Act. Okay, the annual gross, gross turnover should be 1.25 million, right? Um, and uh, the third point must not be connected to an enterprise having a gross annual turnover more than 1.25 million. Many a times we see companies or businesses coming to uh, visit us saying they should be classified as MSME and they actually want to benefit from certain incentive. But we see that they are connected with bigger companies. Uh, let's say the, the parent company is much bigger and earning more than 1.25 million. Apologies for that. Uh, so we see that 
the parent company is much bigger company than the com the smaller company which is actually visiting us for the classification of msme so in other words these people will not uh, these companies or business will not be classified as msme right okay this is the criteria which we use to classify micro small and medium micro is uh, an enterprise where the business earns 50000 or less annually right you are future taxpayers okay remember msme means you are future taxpayers right at the moment our role is to just let you grow right help you assist you so small enterprise is an enterprise which earns between 50 to 300 thousand dollars annually and medium enterprise is an enterprise or business company earning between 300 thousand to 1.25 million okay just uh, just to let you know na, like uh, at first when before i joined msme my actually i thought the leading one would have been agriculture right but to my amaze the leading sector is transport and storage we have the highest number of msmes registered for transport and storage so you'll see retail of motor vehicles or retail other retail stores the canteens which is second one okay um so this is just for information purpose right agriculture 393 i mean i think most of you would be in the second one okay so now what is our role at msme center right okay um many a times we see taxpayers coming to frcs requesting okay uh, how do i make my return or which tax should i register in now like maybe you're not aware whether you should pay tax to frcs or not but there is a fear there's a fear okay no when i'll go uh, visit frcs maybe i'll be imposed with penalty or something to pay right but remember you are future taxpayers you are not taxpayers right now if you are earning thirty thousand and less thirty thousand profit not thirty thousand income remember for us who are workers right we earn thirty thousand dollars right as an i mean salary if we earn any dollar above thirty thousand dollars we are to pay pay tax but for you as entrepreneurs or smes you have to gain a profit of thirty thousand dollars to be taxed meaning maybe your income is two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars per annum and your expense maybe um is a okay let's say two hundred thousand is income and hundred eighty thousand dollars is expense so you're left with twenty thousand dollars profit so you are not to pay any tax to frcs that's how your tax is imposed right remember for salary and wage earners us we pay thirty thousand above if we earn thirty thousand above we pay taxes but for you you are allowed those expenses right so at our in here you can come and learn which is the eligible or legitimate expenses you can claim right for you as entrepreneurs or uh, you as entrepreneurs or already you're in the field of business you have to keep your records right very accurate and sometimes we see taxpayers claiming um much more than i mean in expense much more than what they have earned right so in that kind of case the assessor assessing you to ask you for the evidence right so you remember record keeping is very important if you're starting a business or maybe you're a i mean a bigger businessman too it's very crucial why because that will keep you on your toes you'll know how much money is in my bank how much i have to spend how much i have to i can how much okay if you have a canteen right and if you don't keep the track of selling those goods right anyhow that maybe the family members coming in just taking in tin tuners or uh, anything from the shelf and you're not recording it and you're not paying yourself back right remember that's like sort of uh loss of revenue for you right so in other words it's a small strategy that if you have a canteen i'm just giving an example i'm not telling you to do it but for me if i have to own a business i would have done such if my family member is also taking groceries from the store i'm running i would pay myself back meaning i would pay for those 
actually stuff which my family members has taken, like my immediate family members. Na? So that's how, how you know where you are standing. If you need to make a big purchase, you know, okay, do I have the money? Do I have the capital? Right? So how should my business record be kept? That was what I was trying to emphasize. What are my compliance obligations? Okay, we see a lineup at FRCS in January. Can somebody tell me why? Tax compliance certificate, right? Because maybe you needed to renew your business license or you have to apply for bank loan or you have to renew a permit. So you visit FRCS and that's, I think that's the time when you know that your certain returns are missing or remember this MSME center is set up for your own benefit. If you really don't know what to be done, this center is situated in room 15, right? Room number 15, CSC, Customer Inquiry Center. So if you don't understand anything, how to lodge your returns, which expenses to claim, how to keep your records, this team can assist you, right? By advising, but not actually doing for you, but by advising. Okay, what incentives are available to help my business grow? There are many which we are going to discuss in the slides ahead. Okay, right now, what we do, if, if you have come to FRCS recently and applied for your tax compliance, you must have used TPOS, right? Your new system, the new portal, where you were actually given a user, a user ID and a unique password, right? So in other words, now, there's less human interaction, meaning if there's any returns missing, any due taxes, it will tell you on spot, okay, this is what is due. But still, it allows you to actually complete the application. So in other words, when you visit us and you didn't actually have, and you, you have not received this username or password, you haven't logged in at FRCS system, so you can always visit us and we'll assist you. Even if you have forgotten your password and you do know what to be done or you've forgotten your username, I know you just use it once or twice a year, so you can visit us for that, we'll assist you. Okay, now, teen registration, right? or tax registration. Many a times we don't understand which taxes we need to register for. A very typical example is PY. We had a very uh, sort of, we have seen that as soon as an, a taxpayer would uh, actually register for TIN, he or she would automatically register for PY. But in other words, why is PY applicable? Okay, PY is applicable where you are actually having employees. You are a, a employer, right? And you're having employees and that employee is earning above $30,000. Then and only you like sort of pay taxes, right? But uh, it doesn't mean that you, if you are an employer and no employee is earning uh, above 30000 you can't actually register for PY. No, you can register for PY, but you will be lodging mm, NIL files, meaning not NIL files, like files only having the details for the employees. Remember, PY is only applicable to you if you're an employer, right? But it doesn't mean that you cannot register as an employer if you have employees earning less than $30,000. For these, the incentive is that like if you have maybe f three or two employees, right? And you are paying them casually or maybe you're paying them less than $10,000 or $30,000 for that matter of fact, you can come and register as six monthly lodger. Meaning right now people who are paying PY, they file in monthly. They make their lodgements monthly. But for SMEs or people who have employees below $30,000, they register for six monthly. That means only two files are due from you, not 12, right? Okay, provisional tax filing registration, I believe many of you here would be service providers, right? Service provider meaning like you must be owning a um, cleaning business or maybe uh, you have a, a plant hire business where maybe you're hiring, giving, giving a plant on hire to bigger, I mean, bigger organizations, right? And you must have seen that they did a 5% provisional tax. Right? Okay, sometimes you see that this is like too much maybe for you because you are still trying to save, no, save money. And you're trying to pump that money back into your business. So what you can do actually, you can actually apply for a certificate of exemption at FRCS, 
right? Which will actually uh, g grant you a certificate, which is again online. You can apply for provisional tax certificate. Remember, if you are a service providing industry or sector, so you can also. Uh, so what happens if you are given this certificate exemption? Then when you are contractee, meaning the person you are engaged with, for example, maybe you are engaged with USP to do cleaning services, right? So when USP would usually make your payment, they would deduct five percent and remit to FRCS. That's your advance tax. Remember that 5% is your money, right? But your contractors, contractee sort of uh, deducted it as your advance tax. So that money is sitting in your ledger, right? After he deducts and pays to FRCS. So when you actually lodge your return, that money will be used as a credit against your payable cases, right? So in other words, sometimes we see it's like it's cumbersome for SMEs because the money is retained and they are not able to use it back in their business. So you can always come and apply provisional tax certificate exemption, and when you once you are issued with this certificate, um, if you'll issue like for example, company A issues it to USP, then USP while making payment won't deduct that five percent. Will make you the gross payment. If ten thousand payment, okay, one thousand payment was due to you, right? If you don't have the certificate, they'll deduct five percent. Remember for service providers, right? Service providers. I'm not talking about the small canteens. The pro the retailers, the service providers. So in other words, by right, you should have been paid $950. But when you have the certificate, the valid one, you'll be paid whole $1,000, right? So it's valid for a year. Okay, now FBT filing and registration, I believe this is like a sort of if you're providing any benefit to your employees, right? If you have a vehicle or you're paying your employees rent, remember if you're paying your employees rent directly to the landlord, then this tax of 20% is applicable. But remember, if you're giving this money cash to your employees, right, and that employee is earning above $30,000, then PY is applicable. But if that person is way below threshold and you know that adding this cash rent to his income will still put him below threshold, then no PY is applicable, right? But remember, when you're giving out money cash to employees as benefit, right, maybe you're paying his rent, Right? That, is, that will be part of his wages. But you are actually, when you are actually paying this directly to the landlord, then that becomes a benefit. And a tax is applicable to you, which is fringe benefit tax. Okay, now VAT filing, service uh, turnover, equal. Service is, is an uh, obsolete tax from last year, August. Right? This tax, service turnover tax and equal. Okay, if you buy meals at McDonald's, right, before, Prior August, you will see that there were three types of tax you are paying, the consumption tax. VAT, STT, and ECAL. Right? These are consumption tax. I had somebody asking uh, about uh, TFR, tax-free zone, that whether they're exempted from VAT. Remember, VAT is a consumption tax. Consumption meaning as you spend, you pay. Right? So... Uh, that's how, I mean, um, we look at the consumption tax. The more you consume, the more you pay. So this HCT, especially for hotel industries too, this was also applicable to uh, prescribed services in the hotel industry. So this is an obsolete tax now. And ECAL has, was a tax which was applicable as 10%, but it has been brought down to 5%. Now, VAT filing, I know most of you would have would have plenty questions there but let me briefly tell you that if you're earning hundred thousand and less it's a voluntary registration system right if you want to register then you register otherwise it's okay hundred thousand above then you are required to register okay and then we issue compliance certificate uh, compliance certificate too right sometimes maybe you have plenty return spending payable so we have a system there you can actually make your arrangements right and then go ahead and apply for this certificate. Remember, FIA is not always right, right? So it doesn't mean that maybe you haven't filed for last year, you cannot visit us, no. You come and actually visit. Okay. If you have actually, you can come and visit us and we'll let you know more. Okay, most of the incentives I've already talked in my previous slide, eh? but these are a few that if you are from agriculture sector, a produce supplier, or uh, from fisheries or uh, tourism, this is ecotourism, right? Sea cruise or river to a safari. 
then you can actually apply for exemption. Your whole income would be exempted. But that again follows a process. You can apply to our policy section writing that you are a produce supplier and you actually asking for the exemption. I've already spoken on, uh, I think, um, 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 provisional tax. And uh, the next would be that if your annual turnover is 300,000, then you can have the liberty of filing an annual VAT return, not monthly. Right, either annual or quarterly. Okay, again, I think I've already covered this. This is something to do with employees. Remember, you are uh, MSME and uh, if you are employing somebody and you, are, you have employed that person for full one year, you can apply for first-time employees incentives. Meaning, if you have paid that person 5000 in a year, FRCS will allow you to claim that wage expense as 7500 150%. Right? So, in other words, these are some incentives which you can come and uh, discuss. Like, if you have employees, right? And even if you have employed a disabled person, again, the duration of time of employment also sort of uh, is applicable, right? Then you are allowed 300%. Mm, okay, now we'll talk about the current and future projects of FRCS. Uh, this Fiji Bloom project, I think many of the women entrepreneurs would be aware of this project, right? So FR, we actually assisted this group by issuing them tax compliance and one-time login code, right? I think it was 9,000 in total. Okay, now I think uh, most of you are also aware of this project too, MSME COVID-19, I mean COVID-19 MSME loan scheme, right? And I think um, maybe some of you are, uh, have also benefited from it, right? So in other words, the category which I have so, uh, the category of enterprises which I showed you in my first slide, this is how we actually used, we have referred the different type of enterprises, meaning if you had actually uh, were earning or a new, were a new organization, who was expected to earn 50,000 less, right? You were eligible for maximum 7,000 loan. And again, it goes for 50 to 300,000, maximum of 14,000 loan. And 300 to 1.25 million, then 21,000. Remember, we had many people coming saying that we applied for 7,000. Um, but I think the main uh, issue there was that your business plan, the business plan which you submitted, right? So the amounts were depending on that, and it was not sort of FRCs in there. It was it came from an independent committee, right? We are just there to assist you in in disbursing and collection of it. Okay. So another project which is ongoing at F, uh, MSME Center is Stronger Together. This is mostly related to employees, where employer can apply for three months wages subsidy for their employees, but employees have to meet certain category. Meaning uh, there are four categories actually. One is they should be sort of affected by COVID-19 and there should be new registrants of FNPF. Third, they should not be uh, members of, F I mean, recipients of MSME loan. And uh, fourth is uh, they should not be pensioners, right? So if they qualify, then, they are, then you can actually apply for their wage subsidy for three months. Uh, we have actually already have started with this project now, but I think this is ongoing. I'm not sure. Okay, any questions? That was tax very briefly. Thank you for the presentation, Shaheen. Without taking too much time, ladies and gentlemen, without, without taking too much of your time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we just want to clarify and let you know that whatever information that was presented to you this afternoon, I know um, there's probably a lot that you need to process and digest, but uh, we have organized um, e-brochures and incentive flyers. You can always contact Vanessa, who is the organizer of the Entrepreneurial Business Fair 2021 or you can simply leave your email and your contact detail on the registration table um, at the far end. And better yet, if you still have any questions or if you want something that you wish to clarify as far as um, Fiji Revenue and Custom Service is concerned, please call our contact center on 1326. Um, we are open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. So do we have any questions uh, from the floor? If there are no questions, we'll hand this over to... Yep, 
Your question, sir? This is uh, actually not so much a question, but uh, I think I can speak on behalf of everybody here that perhaps what has been mentioned there is too long for anyone to remember. <laughs> and can you not supply a printout of that to everybody here? Sure, not to worry, we have the presentations already saved in the computer, all right, by the agreement of our FERCA office. Uh, they're leaving it here for the dissemination for all our members here, if you want it, eh? All, eh? Right, there are about 500 people here. Okay, okay. and just one more, the, the first presenter about capital gain tax. I am just wondering, and I'm subject to correction here, I thought that capital gain tax has been removed from the last budget. Is it not? If it has been removed, why mention it? Uh, thank, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the, the tax that has been removed is stamp duties. They are almost, they are on the same, same line as uh, CGT. It deals with uh, properties as well, basically on uh, legal documents. So when you're selling a property, there is a legal document involved. We call it a transfer document. And the transfer document is subject to stamp duties, which is the stamping of the document and makes, uh, making it legal. So at the 2020-2021 budget, the government has repealed the Stamp Duties Act. So Right now, STEM duties is not applicable. Yeah, uh, are, you, are, you, are you saying that the, the capital gain tax is uh, st still applicable right now? Still alive, yes. <laughs> Naka, I think we'll have only one more last question because we're... I think we are talking, we are, for that we are talking about the leases that is issued by housing authority. That is a policy for housing authority. What I understand is when they give out a lease, they have these lease conditions that you have to, that you have to meet. So one of the conditions is that you have to build. Build within a certain time, time period that they give. So if you still haven't built and then you are selling this vacant land, you will be subject to that 10% penalty that they give out. Clear? All right. Can we just give a round of applause to these uh, dedicated people from FERCA? And we'll ask them not to overcharge us, eh? small business operators, eh? All right? Thank you very much, FERCA representatives. Eh? Yeah, please come back next year when we invite you. Eh? All right, we have our last presenter, uh, an entrepreneur. Okay, we'd like to welcome. Uh...
All right, can you just stand up, please, for a break of about two, two to three minutes, please, eh? Right, stretch. Have you been a break? Was that too go quick? You know what? Go. Okay, yeah, this is going to be our last presenter for, uh, for this afternoon, okay? Because before we break off at, uh, at about uh, uh, maybe 6.20 to 6.30. All right, uh, we have here, uh, we have Mr. Michael Tauler. What is the company? Okay, Mr. Michael Taylor from PFD. Uh, well, that's his company, and, uh, and he's probably, I, I mean, he's here to do the presentation, and he is going to tell us what does F, a PFD mean, all right? So just give him a round of applause, please. Eh? Bula. Namaste. G'day. As you can see, I might be Australian. Is there anybody here from the islands in the Pacific? Solomon Islands? No? I spent 15 years in Papua New Guinea, so I learned to speak pidgin, so apin and turogata. Just turn it off and on. Turn it back on again. Does it work? Okay, all right. <coughs> this uh, slide up here is going to be uh, delivered later in the, uh, the presentation. So, firstly, my name's Michael Towler. I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of Suva, the traditional custodians of this land on which we gather today and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I extend the respect that all Fijian people of this land and many islands that make up this beautiful country. Who am I? Well, I'm an Australian by birth, but I'm a Fijian by choice. I might look like a short, fat Kaivalangi, but I can assure you I'm just as Kaiviti as anyone here today. I can taste the difference between pure waka and a blended mix. And I know the benefit of a grog session, which is very much part of the culture here in Fiji. I'm the current president of the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Industry Council of Fiji. And I'm the past chairman of the Fiji Exporters Council. And I want to acknowledge Humphrey Chang, who was a long time member of that same council. I'm also a director of the Fiji Australia Business Council. I'm honoured to hold these leadership positions along with the one I perform as managing director of my own business, PFD Fiji Limited. I'm married to Li Zhu. By the name, you can see that she's Chinese. She's born in Shanghai. She came to Australia in 1989 and we have enjoyed 32 years of marriage. I have two daughters. Jessica, whose mother is from Papua New Guinea, and Lucy, who I enjoy with my wife, Lee. I'm conflicted when the Wallabies play the fine, fine Fijians, especially in the last World Cup where the Fijians went very close to pulling off a major upset in the first game of the tournament. And I cheered for Fiji in the first half when they were winning, but unfortunately I had to cheer for Australia in the second half when they won. My daughter Lucy, who is now 21 years of age, when she was young, she was asked her mother, Mum, if Australia plays China in a soccer match, who are you going to barrack for? And 
I used to say to her, the important part is, Lucy, who are you going to barrack for? Because you are half Chinese and half Australian. <laughs> so, I was born in Chinchilla, a small country town on the western edge of the Darling Downs in southern Queensland. My father was a plumber. And he had his own small business, but he was also a pig farmer. And at eight years of age, I had to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and help my brothers feed 600 pigs. We had a hard life to hoe in those days. My mother taught me a sense of, belong of worth and belonging and instilled in me good Christian values and a sense of fairness in everything that I do. She has been a very important part of my life for nearly 66 years and she is still alive today at 93 years of age. My father instilled in me a good work ethic, the value of saving money for a rainy day and the importance of hard work, and I thank them both for those qualities. <coughs> what do I do? I manufacture life jackets, amongst other things in a factory at Nambua. We employ 200 Fijians, 75% of them women. On top, all on top, and all my top and middle management are female. In the Pacific, most of the hard work is done by females. Thank you for that. In this, the week of the National International Women's Day. My journey to Fiji and where I am today is a long journey. So strap yourself in and get comfortable. This is my long journey. My education started at a Catholic primary school in Chinchilla, then later at a Morris Brothers College in Brisbane. I didn't enjoy school. I wasn't a very good student because I wasn't very good with rules and I felt their cane often. I began my formal working life in the Bank of New South Wales, which is known today as the Westpac, at 15 years of age. This is probably where I developed a healthy disdain for bankers, but more about that later. At the tender age of 16, I ventured to Papua New Guinea. PNG in those days was a mandated territory of Australia. I landed on Bougainville Island, June the 12th, 1971. I remember it like it was yesterday. There was a big copper mine. The American company Bechtel was constructing it, st constructing the mine and all its infrastructure. I worked in a survey gang as a chainman, later for Ansett Airlines of Papua New Guinea, but then became Air New Guinea. I lived and worked on Bougainville Island, Rabaul, Madang and Port Moresby. There were various other jobs that I did, but then I purchased my own small business in Port Moresby. It was a small supermarket. It was not a successful venture for me, though it was a good learning curve. One of the points that I make throughout this is that unsuccessful ventures are not always ultimate and total failures. When you aren't successful at something, you do learn something. I got married under a big rain tree on the Illa Beach in Port Moresby at the tender age of 23 to a 19-year-old Papuan girl. Her name Janice Ihe, and we had a daughter Jessica, who is now 37 years old and she lives and works in Brisbane. I returned from PNG to live and work in Australia in 1984 when sadly my wife Janice passed away. <coughs> I went to work in Toowoomba, Queensland, with my brother Pat in a hardware and plumbing business. I mentioned earlier my father was a plumber and he taught me some of his trade, so it was re relatively easy to get accustomed to that type of work. Learning the trade and principles of running a business, where I discovered that those principles of operating a business don't change much, no matter what you do. From 1988 to 1998, I started a new business with my brother-in-law. It was something new to me, but the principles of business are all the same. It was a water sports equipment distribution business that eventually led to the manufacturing business that I now have here in Fiji, mainly water skiing and windsurfing products. All water sports require life jackets. That is why I mainly make, that is what I mainly make in my factory at Nambua today. In 1972, 1992, I came to Fiji on business for the manufacturing of our life jacket range. We had engaged with a local company who were located at Wallo Bay. 
to contract them to make a range of life jackets for our water sports distribution business. We had been distributing life jackets for a manufacturer based in Sydney, but their business model was failing and their life jacket range was boring and losing market share. My business partner and my brother-in-law, Phil Hatcher, found an Australian designer who was working with a local Fijian manufacturer who were making sailboard sales and after two years of development, product certification, raw material pro procurement and acquiring equipment from Australia, we had finally got to the stage of shipping our first life jackets out of Fiji to Australia in September 1992. 6,000 units in the first year, all by air freight. 12,000 units in the second year, a combination of air freight and sea freight. And 30,000 units in the third year, all by sea freight. The business had grown well beyond our original plans. We were for forecasting 60,000 units for the fourth year and our exports from Fiji peaked at over 300,000 life jackets. We now have a steady 250,000 life jackets exported from Fiji every year. This was beyond the capacity of the local manufacturer and we asked, uh, and they asked us to joint venture a bigger factory at a rental premises in Nambua. We agreed and we moved into our joint venture business in April of 1996. And we are now still there today, 25 years later. Why? Because I saw a bright future here and Fiji's geographical location to its main target markets of Australia and New Zealand gives us a very unique advantage over its competitors. There are some negatives for business here too. The big issues that we deal with in those negatives is absenteeism and productivity. The two big drawbacks that industry here in Fiji, but they are capable of being overcome. There are some seriously hardworking people here in Fiji. They are just difficult to find, but when you do, you should do everything that you can to make sure that you can keep them. Over those 25 years, we purchased the factory land and building from our landlord in the year 2000, and we also acquired the shareholding of our local partner in the same year. It was the year of the infamous coup that stopped us all in our tracks, and I must admit it was the only time since I had come to Fiji that I really thought that it was the wrong decision. They were very dark days indeed, but we all eventually got through it and I think we we're all a little wiser for what happened during that time. The experience that we gained from that terrible event made us better businessmen. In 2019, I became the sole shareholder of this business, having acquired the shareholding of my two business partners, including my brother-in-law. Today, my wife, Li, Li Zhu, who joined our business in 2001 after the birth of our daughter Lucy, is both my partner in life and my business. She is the rock that holds me and the business together, as are the 150 Fijian women and 50 Fijian men who are employed in my factory. So why Fiji? Well, I usually answer that question with why not? It's a nice place, it's nice people, and the fishing is fantastic. <laughs> Seriously though, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, there was a big push in Australia and New Zealand to source product offshore. And the Spartica Agreement, S-P-A-R-T-E-C-A, -E only a bureaucrat could actually think of Spartica. It stands for South Pacific Area Regional Technical Economic and Cooperation Agreement. You have to be a bureaucrat to actually think of that. Australia and New, New, New Zealand had negotiated with the Forum Island countries and gave preferential access, which is duty free, to the Australian and New Zealand markets for products manufactured with a minimum of 50% of Forum Island content for those Forum Island countries, including Australia and New Zealand. The Fijian government of the day was also offered a very lucrative 13 year company tax holiday and allowed us to import all our equipment and raw material duty-free and tax-free into Fiji. Those were the good old days. It was a great incentive and it was extremely successful in attracting manufacturing businesses to these shores. The idea was that we would source our raw material from Australia and New Zealand and we would cre create employment 
for those by having those goods manufactured in Forum Island member countries. This mainly attracted the garment manufacturing as well as a few other industries. By 2000, the year 2000, there were more than 80, more than 80 factories manufacturing garments in Fiji for the Australian New Zealand markets. I may add, Fiji was really the only country out of all the Forum Island group that picked up the ball and ran with it, to use that rugby analogy. Many manufacturers and big brands came to Fiji, but then the bubble burst. Firstly, the WTO declared the US quota system illegal under WTO rules, and the 2000 coup came along and scared a lot of manufacturers away. Most of them decamped to China, but I stayed. And why, you may ask? Well, that is another long story, and I don't have time for it now, but I recognise the value of manufacturing in a geographical location that is close to its target markets. And for all its faults, and there are few, Fiji is ge geographically close to its mar target markets of Australia and New Zealand, and the product that we were making was light and bulky and required shipping by sea. And Fiji is only four or five days away from those two target markets, whereas the Asian manufacturers are up to two weeks away from that by sea. So, what lessons have I learnt? The most important business asset I have is my staff, the people who work for me. Without them, I do not have a business. I take care of them, I treat them well, I treat them fairly, and ensure that they are appropriately compensated for their efforts. I care for them, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and I recognise them as individuals as well as a team. And I've always celebrated the cultural diversity. Fijians love team sports, and they work well in a team. TCF industry factories require a lot of teamwork. Fijians know how to enjoy life, and, the big, and, in, and in the big scheme of things, Fijians are happy people and enjoy, and I enjoy being around them. That's why I became a Fijian citizen myself. Kaivalangi, now Kaiviti. <laughs> COVID has taught us a few things. COVID has taught us to do business differently with our customers and with our team meetings with our Brisbane office. We have to now do it by Zoom. At first, it was a bit of a struggle but with an investment in some good quality equipment and the previous decision to upgrade our internet connection to a fast fibre optic cable has paid dividends for us. And whilst we do still want to travel to meet our customers face to face, the savings that we have pocketed from our travel budget have been significant. I do not think we'll ever return to doing the amount of business travel that we did before. Sorry Fiji Airways we did before COVID because we are now learnt the value of, and the mythology of doing business over the internet using this technology. This technology and doing business this way with the tools like Zoom is here to stay. Now I need to want to say something about banks and banking because without banks and without their banking facilities we can't run our businesses. There is a saying I think it comes out of the Bible, that money is the root of all evil. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that saying, but it can make good men and good women do evil things. In business, working capital is the second most important asset after the staff. It's the oil that makes the wheels of industry turn. Without business capital, it just won't happen. So it's important to have a good working relationship with your bankers. The problem for me is that 66 years of age, I'm an old school businessman. But today, banking has changed to a model that I don't recognise anymore. And I don't think it's sustainable. The modern banking system is very impersonal. It's run by computers, robots, algorithms. Tick all the boxes, add up all these points, and the answer is no. Sorry, you no longer fit the model. What? Seriously? After 25 years of being your customer, I no longer fit the model? <sighs> the, 
the model is now known as a banking algorithm. But I have never defaulted on any of my loans and ever, you have ever given me. Sorry, you no longer fit the model. You know the story. But it means nothing anymore. It's mind boggling and I think it's just bad business. However, there's a thing called the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. I told you earlier during my school years I didn't do well with rules and it caused me a lot of pain then and maybe it is going to cause me a lot of pain again. But it's time for someone stood up to them and called them out for what they have become. It's just rank stupidity. The internet has been a boon for banking and has become part of the 24-7 cycle that we've all been sucked into via social media. Sadly, me too. I've been sucked into that social media. I can go online banking in multiple countries while I'm lying watching Netflix at night time. I can pay my Australian staff's wages while I'm watching Netflix at my house at Lammy at night time. Yes, it is very inconvenient, but it, it does take the personal relationships out of the mix because their business model now relies upon automation. It will eventually cost a lot of people working in the, bil in the banking industry their jobs. And I won't be offering any unemployed bankers a job in my business. In 2008, when the, the GFC descended upon us, governments around the world bailed out the banks. They were too big to fail, we were told. Oh, now, I'm not qualified to say whether that decision was right or wrong. I'll leave the judgment of that up to others who are more qualified than me. But it seemed to me to be the right decision at the time. In 2020, COVID hit. It hit us like a sledgehammer. Only Bill Gates predicted 15 years, uh, for, sorry, five years earlier, and no one took any notice of him at the time. It's amazing that the only man that predicted COVID five years ago, or five years before it actually happened, has now been the subject of conspiracy theories on the social media and the internet, saying that he was part of causing it. Crazy. He told us to spend more. He, said, he told us we spend more money on arming the world for war when we should have been arming the world for the w war against viruses. If Bill Gates could see it coming and warned us about it, the governments around the world didn't see it coming, or more importantly, wouldn't, and the world was not prepared for it. It was the banks' turn to bail out industry. Unfortunately, they failed miserably. Yes, they passed on repayments on existing loans, not because they wanted to. Sorry, they passed on paused repayments on existing loans, not because they wanted to, but because they had no other choice. But when it came to providing support to their existing business customers who needed their support at the time, they failed miserably and they failed to turn up to do the heavy lifting when it was absolutely required. It was a hypocrisy of the highest order. They will all pay a heavy price for their duplicity and they will only have themselves to blame. I personally won't be shedding any tears for them when they lose their customers because they were not there for them when they needed them the most. In my own case, I, like most other businesses, stared into the abyss of the unknown when COVID turned up in March of 2020. We went into lockdown and shut down our business for five weeks. We paid all of our staff everything that they were entitled to, paying out a portion of their sick leave and then some more, just to tide them over until we could get a handle on what the future held for us. On May the 5th, with a lot of apprehension, we reopened with only 130 of the 200 staff. The first few weeks we proceeded cautiously, calling all our customers for some orders, but they were all locked down in New Zealand and Australia. And the future was something very bleak, was looking very bleak for us and for our customers. Slowly, and I, <coughs> excuse me. Slowly, and I think very cautiously, a few of them started to give us some orders. Then a trickle of orders turned into a rush, and right now it's a big flood. By July, we were just about back up to full capacity with 180 of our staff employed. 
That has now risen to 190 plus, nearly back to where we were. And each month was busier than the previous one. Last weekend, we were forced into working on a Sunday. Not because we wanted to, because we had to. And we may have to do it again this coming Sunday. I'm very much aware of not burning out the most important resource I have, my staff. But as the saying goes, we must make hay while the sun shines. Our biggest problem now is the world's shipping. It's in a disarray. And this disruption is now starting to impact our ability to ship raw material and ship out the finished goods on time. However, we have a very good team of logistics staff, very well led by my wife, Lee, from our Brisbane office, who has been able to manage our logistics and keep our operation here in Fiji running reasonably smoothly. In the immediate future, I have to say this, COVID has been good for my business. But like everyone else, I want to see this pandemic end as quickly as possible. Why has COVID been good for us and devastating for a lot of other industries? It's very obvious to us in our target markets of Australia and New Zealand, they cannot travel abroad for holidays. So they have a holiday at home and boat sales in both these two countries is up nearly 90%. Every boat needs up to a dozen life jackets and that is the simple answer to why our business has been doing so well. And this will not change throughout 2021, nor do I think it will stop in 2022. But then I am the eternal optimist. That's why my wife and wife Lee and I are a good team. She's my counterbalance. She believes that 2022 will be a downturn and we will need to be prepared for that. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. We don't only make life jackets, but they are our core business and normally 70% of what we do. But in the past 12 months, life jackets has been 90% of our business. We even make something as strange as a hunting dog breastplate. I'm sure nobody here in this room would know what a hunting dog breastplate is. I didn't, either, I didn't know it until the fellow that actually wanted us to make them came and brought them to me. In places like Australia and New Zealand, Wild pigs are a very big problem. They're a very big problem for farmers. And they employ people with hunting dogs to hunt them down and kill them, to eradicate them from destroying valuable farming land. These dogs can cost up to $15,000 each, Australian dollars each. And the last thing you want is a wild boar who have large sharp tusks killing your prized dog. So they fit them with a breastplate and we make them here in a factory at Nambua. We also make sublimated sportswear, which just simply fell off a cliff last year. Our exports were down 70%, but it too has come roaring back in 2021. And exports in this product range are back to where they were pre-COVID. Why? Because community and school sports are back on the agenda in both Australia and New Zealand. We also make rescue equipment, portable stretchers and ambulance extraction devices and a few other products related to that industry. Demand in those areas has not changed during COVID. It's been the same as previous years. So we started out with putting up there on the screen a, a learning tool that I actually had brought to me a long time ago, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. It's a book written by an American, Stephen Covey. My cousin Tony introduced me to this program many, many years ago. He first gave me the book to read, but like Habit 7, I didn't have time to stop and sharpen the saw. When he discovered I hadn't read the book, he summarised it for me into a learning tool. A learning tool resource that made me dig deeper into it and I eventually became hooked. It has been a big part of what I do in business ever since. So I've prepared a short and simple PowerPoint presentation on it for you. So, I'm pointing this up. You, you might do it for me. Okay, sure. So, be, to be proactive, to begin with the end in mind, put first things first, think win-win, seek first to understand, synergize and sharpen the saw. They're all really strange titles, but I'm sure you'll get a little bit of an idea about them. So, the first one, to be proactive. This is the one 
habit that I actually mention most often to my staff in my factory. To take responsibilities for your actions and make educated decisions. So to be proactive, to start trying to think outside the square. It's very important in business. You can't just simply follow a guideline all the time. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. So to actually start on a project, start on a job, you need to know what the end is before you're going to begin. Simple as simple as loading a 20-foot container for export. We need to start thinking about how we're going to get all of this in there and not leave anybody, any behind. So we have to have come up with a bit of a plan. So you've got to define your goals, define your goals and take action. Habit three, put first things first. Put your goals into a plan and follow it with the end goal in mind. So you don't want to actually start doing things that you don't need to do or you have to do at the end. When you're going to put first things first, you need to once again come up with a plan. So to put first things first means that you actually need to sort out a plan about what you're going to do. In manufacturing, it's extremely important. You can't have belts and buckles for life jackets coming at the beginning when you need them at the end. Habit four is what we call thinking win-win. Everybody needs to benefit. There's no good me making a big profit out of my products and my customer is not making much profit at all. He, don't, he won't want to sell them in the end and then he'll stop giving me the orders. So we need to think that, hey, how are we going to price this product? How much does this product sell at the end, in, in the retail shops in Australia and New Zealand? How much does he need to make out of it? How much do we need to make out of it? So everybody can benefit, not just one. Because if one person benefit, the others don't, it won't succeed. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. This is very important in F Fiji. I've learned after 29 years of being in Fiji that when I ask questions, I can see on people's faces that they firstly didn't understand it and that answer that I got was probably not right. So f I need to first to understand the things that I'm telling people. We need to balance the two. But we also need to actually listen to what other people have got to say. There can't be only one opinion in how things are done in a business. Not everybody's got a mortgage on, not, not one person has got a mortgage on good ideas. Everybody has some idea about something, so let's listen to everybody. Listen to what others have to say and make sure your, your opinion is also heard. Synergize, very important. Everybody needs to get on the same page. Cooperation, combine your ideas, gets an even better result. When one person's idea is the only idea that you're following, I can guarantee you that it won't be successful as collective ideas. And finally, this last one, the one that I actually sometimes have a habit of not following. It says here to renew yourself physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually. Constantly better yourself in all aspects of life. Actually, a lot of people don't think about stopping for a moment and taking the time to just think about what they're doing, how to do it better, but also just yourself in your whole life to actually remember that, we need to, that we're human beings. We need to make up lots of different things along the way. So these are the hev seven habits. It, it's a much more intensive learning tool. I don't have the time to actually go through it all here today. But what I do have is to actually recommend it to you. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And I believe that the Fiji Times actually was, has been featuring one of these habits uh, each week for the past uh, couple of weeks. So um, they actually have a very good learning resource on it. But there is a great learning resource on this online. So...
the long-term future for manufacturers in Fiji. Being the internal optimist that I am, I've always been very optimistic about what the future holds for, for us. I do believe that there's always opportunities out there just waiting to be pursued. And I also believe that Fiji is a unique geographical advantage to be the location of choice for Australian and New Zealand markets, especially since there's been a bit of a desire in both those markets to move away from relying upon Asia to be their supplier of choice. <coughs> Aussies and Kiwis love coming to Fiji for a holiday. So what, there is no better mix than holiday and doing business at the same time. We have a distinct advantage though we have a distinct advantage though in that virtually all raw dis, sorry we have a distinct disadvantage though in that virtually all raw material <coughs> has to be imported and that situation will never change a multitude of reasons but i don't have time right now to go through them but this is the reason why we definitely need to ensure that our shipping services into and out of fiji are properly regulated and supported with efficient government and savvy government services like ports, biosecurity and custom services. <coughs> government has a very important role to play here. That's why whoever is the government of the day, needs, we need to be able to sit down and together put aside our ideological differences and work together for the betterment of everybody concerned. So far, we as industry have been able to do that with the current the government and we are very appreciative of those opportunities. Fiji has a great human resource and a very bright future ahead of it and that's one of the reasons why I stayed. For, finally I'd like to say thank you to the organizers of this forum especially Vanessa who extended this kind invitation to me and thank you too for attending and listening to my journey in and to Fiji. I've enjoyed every minute of that journey, including the challenges that it throws up from time to time. But I wouldn't change anything. It's been a fantastic journey so far and I'm looking forward to the future, even at my age, and I'm 66 next month. I would like to quote you an article from the Fiji Sun, who I know is one of the sponsors of this event. And of all people, it's a quote from a banker. But one I do have some admiration for. Part of the article mentioned saw how he responded to many professional roles he had to play. And he shared a few daily tips that he practiced and they resonated with me because I agree with them all. The importance of having a laugh. That's one of the things that I love about Fijians is they, lo they know how to laugh. Spending quality time with your family. Fijians know that better than anybody else in the world. How to spend quality time with your family. Number three was eating chocolate. Very important. Always eat some chocolate, some good dark chocolate. It's good for you. As you can see, I eat chocolate. Catching up with your friends. Very important thing to do. This was all good advice. So to conclude, I want to finish with a verse from Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. It's a very famous poem. I've always been intrigued by it and I've found I could apply passages of this poem in my everyday life, or at least my everyday working life. And it goes like this. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things that you gave your life to, broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. Thank you for listening to me. You've been a great audience. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Talok. Uh, can we just give him a round of applause again, eh? Right, so he's a, he's a Fijian, this guy. He's, a, he's stayed here for over 20 years, eh? All right? All right, uh, uh, have you got your phones ready? Okay, we're about to... Okay, a question has just been posted uh, just a few seconds ago. 
all right, on the presentation that, uh, that you've just seen here on the screen today, eh? all right, for a chance to win yourself this package that we have here on the right-hand side, okay? We really want to give it out today, eh? all right, because we see that, um, that you have been attended throughout the, throughout the sessions, which, which have begun from 2 p.m. right through now. Um, I think it's after 6 p.m. now, okay? All right, the, uh, the questions uh, we've, we've put there on the, on the app, right, for those of you who have access to our USP Entrepreneurial Fair app, right? We will take the first answer, according to Mr. Tallow, of course. All right, do we have a winner? Well, he's checking right now, okay? We have uh, a few answers that have been posted. We want to be really correct on the answer, okay? All right, uh, we, have a, we have a winner, Marida Salusalu. If she's here or she isn't here, is she here? Oh, there she is. Okay, round of applause, please. <laughs> right? Okay, okay, okay. A photo, please. Oh, really? Benny, <laughs> Benny, phone please. Mr. Amar, Amar, Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, okay. Um, Vanessa, just go and get the phone. Oh, okay. All right, we will uh, we will meet again uh, here at the University uh, the, the Japan ICT Theatre tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eh? Okay, uh, friends, 2 p.m. Uh, we will meet here again tomorrow for our final day, and then we'll finish up at 5:30 p.m. tomorrow, in which time we will hand out your certificates. All right. Okay, so hopefully uh, the people from uh, from CJ Patel will be out giving out coffee for tomorrow, right? So uh, that concludes our program for the day. Thank you very much.
Tu m'as dit que 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 tu m